Hello students and welcome to lecture 9. This is the first in two lectures on viruses and virology. Virology is a subdiscipline of microbiology and uh, there are people who spend their whole lives studying just viruses and people who spend their whole lives studying just one virus for example. We'll, we will just get a brief introduction to virology. As I said earlier this course is a survey course so we're Basically, you know, it's, it's, it's as if you were studying an introductory course in European history and we only end up spending one week dealing with the history of each country in Europe. That would, that would seem very superficial, but uh, that's what introductory courses are. So uh, virology is a little bit different than the other types of microbiology because, as we said earlier, viruses are not actually living things. And so if you want to study viruses and if you want to isolate viruses, you can't really grow them in a culture the way you can with bacteria. Uh, you know, you just put sugar into, a, into water and you sterilize it and you can basically grow any type of bacteria in that, in that water, uh, that nutrient-enriched water. You can't do the same thing with viruses because viruses do not are not alive outside of living cells and so you have to propagate and culture viruses as it's called you propagate and culture viruses inside uh, cell lines which are you know uh, living cells uh, so there are all kinds of different laboratory techniques that you have to employ when you're studying viruses as well so we will deal with some of those and uh, so let's begin so basically what I'm going to do in this lecture is I'm going to talk about the general characteristics of viruses and then in lecture 10 which is next uh, I will will run through specific examples of viruses from different viral families okay so an overview of the general characteristics of viruses first of all viruses obviously are obligate intracellular parasites they cannot live outside of cells because they don't have any metabolic machinery of their own they don't have any ribosomes they don't have any uh, they don't have any mitochondria certainly to make ATP they don't have any way to generate energy they basically just have a container called a capsid that contains the genome and the genome it's like a couple of a few rogue genes rogue genes that are traveling from cell to cell in a little container that's what viruses are um, now viruses are classified according to different uh, criteria and one of one of them is the shape of their capsid so remember the capsid is the case the little container that contains the viral genome and then that container may be what's called naked versus enveloped. Now, naked means the capsid is made of protein. Capsid is made of protein. And if it has no further coating outside of the protein, you say that's a naked virus. If it has a phospholipid bilayer outside of the capsid, you say that it's an enveloped virus. Right? So we classify uh, there, are, there are three basic uh, capsid shapes that's one way to classify the viruses there is and then you further classify them according to whether the capsid does or does or does not have a phospholipid bilayer outside of it and then finally there's a classification system called the Baltimore system of classification which classifies the viruses according to what type of genome they have now, most, almost all of the organisms on Earth have a double-stranded DNA genome, and so they're all the same. Viruses are the only things that are different from that. And so vi some viruses have a double-stranded DNA genome, but some of them have a single-stranded genome, some of them have a double-stranded RNA genome, and some of them have a single-stranded RNA genome. And some of them have a, 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 a you know, they, whether they have a double-stranded or a single-stranded genome and whether it's DNA or RNA, you can further divide them according to whether or not they, the genome is segmented or not, meaning that is the whole viral genome on a single chromosome? Is it on a single circular chromosome? Or is it on a linear chromosome? Or is it on two or more chromosomes? So I've already mentioned the fact that the influenza virus has eight chromosomes. It's an RNA virus, which makes the influenza virus particularly nasty because the fact that it has an RNA genome means that it is subject to antigenic drift, 
and you know antigenic drift is the tendency of RNA genomes to accumulate mutations faster than DNA genomes. If you accumulate mutations faster, that, that means that the proteins on your surface or the proteins that make up your capsid will be changing constantly and therefore staying one step ahead of the immune system. It's a way of immune system evasion, genetic drift. And then if, if, if you have an RNA virus, so all RNA viruses are capable of genetic drift. If the RNA virus has a segmented genome, in addition to being able to do genetic drift, it can also do genetic shift, which is where uh, a person or an animal is co-infected with two different strains of the influenza virus. And then the chromosomes get reassorted so you have chromosome, simple chromosome, simple Mendelian chromosome rearrangement or reassortment rather, uh, which is what happens in humans and all kinds of other animals uh, in order to get completely different variations. All right, so, so that's why of all the viruses, the influenza virus is particularly nasty because it's, it's capable of both antigenic drift and antigenic shift. Uh, anyway, we'll talk about that later, but that, that is the Baltimore classification system is a method of classifying viruses not based on their capsid shape and not based on whether they're naked or enveloped, but based on what type of what their genome is made out of. Okay, then we'll talk about the difference between lytic infections and latent infections and persistent infections and something called lysogenic infections. Basically, a lytic infection is where a virus invades a cell. Basically, what happens with a virus is a virus invades a cell and then it, use, it, it usurps or hijacks the cell's metabolic machinery to make more viruses. So a virus gets into a cell and takes it over and then uses the machinery of that cell to make more viruses that come out and invade more cells that make more viruses and come out and invade more cells. Okay, that's, that's their only reason for existence. That's, that's their only purpose is to make more viruses. And so um, if they make, if the virus is particularly aggressive, in quotes, if the virus is particularly aggressive, that means that it gets into a cell and it takes over the machinery and uses that machinery of the cell to make more viruses. And it makes so many viruses that it actually, that these viruses, when they all come out, it actually bursts and destroys the cell. When that happens, we call that a lytic infection. And we say that that, that, that virus is a lytic virus. Okay, there are other viruses that are more what they call temperate. Temperate means that they're mild tempered, basically. They, they don't have an aggressive nature. So they get into the cell, they take over the machinery to produce more viruses, but they only produce a few more viruses, produce a few viruses at a time, and these viruses are able to come out without killing the cell. So that's the difference between a lytic infection and a lysogenic infection, or a lytic virus and a lysogenic virus. Lysogenic virus is also known as a temperate virus. Okay, and then in addition to all that, you can have a persistent infection, you can have an acute infection, a chronic infection, a persistent infection, or a latent infection, and we will deal with all of those. Then when we've discussed all of those things, we'll have a very brief introduction to some of the unique lab techniques that you use to maintain and culture and grow viruses, given the fact that they can't exist outside of living cells. So we have to give them some living cells to, uh, to grow inside, to live inside. And then finally, we'll discuss how vaccines work. Okay, so vaccines are the only defense that we have against viruses. Uh, and uh, we haven't even been able to make successful vaccines against all of the viruses, and I'll explain why. Um, but so for bacteria, we can usually kill, uh, we can usually kill bacteria using, using antibiotics. From the homework assignments, you now know that the, that the uh, bacteria are catching up to us with antibiotic resistance genes which they pass around to, to each other during conjugation and other forms of uh, genetic exchange. So the, the day may come, and it may come sooner than we think, the day may come when antibiotics don't work anymore. But generally for, for now, we can kill bacteria with antibiotics. Those are special drugs that kill the bacteria without harming the human that the bacteria is infecting. Okay, protozoa. Uh, they're a little bit di more difficult to kill. Fungi are, again, more difficult to kill. 
And uh, but once you get to viruses, there's no there are some therapeutic drugs like AZT and so on that kind of slow down or interfere in the replication of viruses. But honestly, none of those methods are as effective as a vaccine that that prepares your immune system to destroy the virus before it can actually infect your cells. And that's what a vaccine does. Basically, in a sentence, what you do is you take a virus and you kill it. It's not, I know it's not really a living thing to begin with, so when I say kill it, I'm, being, I'm speaking in metaphors. So you take a virus and you destroy it, you make it non-viable by either heating it up or, or cross-linking its proteins with a chemical called formalin, or other, in some way you kill the virus, and by kill I mean you simply make it non-viable so that it can, it's non-infectious. And then you inject that virus into a person and that person's immune system will prepare a response for that virus for the next time you see it and presumably the next time your immune system and your body sees the virus, it will be live. It'll be, it'll be infectious. And so, but, but your immune system will be prepared for it and it will destroy those viruses before they have a chance to get into your cells. That's how a vaccine works and a vaccine is our only defense it's our only effective defense against viruses. As I said, there are some drugs that, that lessen the severity of viral infections, but to be honest, most of them are not, worth, not really worth that much. They're nowhere near as useful as a vaccine. All right, so as we said, viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. They cannot live outside of living cells. They don't have any of their own metabolic machinery. They contain, a virus is a group of rogue genes, you know, a few genes that are contained inside a compartment called a capsid. They enter the cell and they usurp the cell's machinery, metabolic machinery. They hijack the cell's metabolic machinery and they use that machinery they, they take over the machinery for the sole purpose of making more viruses. And those viruses come out, if a lot of them come out at once, it may burst the cell and kill it. That would be a lytic virus. If, it, if they come out more slowly, the, the cell is able to survive and that would be a lysogenic virus. Right. right, so the new capsids, new capsids, which are made of proteins, by the way, and new viral genomes are made inside the host cells, H-O-S-T, host, host cells. And then the genome is packaged into the capsid and then they exit and they infect new cells and make more viruses and so on and so on. So this is how they work. A virus infects a cell. The, the viral genome uncoats. It comes out of the capsid and then it takes over the cell's machinery, uses it to make more viruses, which then go out and infects more cells and so on. Okay, so once again, the capsid is the small compartment that contains the viral genome. It is made of protein. The individual, it's usually a, a multi-subunit capsid. It's made of multiple parts. Those, the individual units, the individual monomers that make up the capsid are referred to as capsomeres, capsomere proteins. A capsid is usually made of identical protein units called capsomeres, so the, the parts are all the same, basically. They, they, if, you put all, if you make those proteins, the capsomere proteins, and you put them together, they will spontaneously and automatically assemble into a virus capsid. Okay, so as I said, a naked virus is where the viral genome is contained within the protein capsid, but there is not a phospholipid bilayer outside of it. An enveloped virus is where you have the capsid surrounded by a phospholipid bilayer. And where did the virus get that phospholipid bilayer? It got it from the cell that it was created inside. So as the so inside the cell, in the cytoplasm of the cell, we have ribosomes that are translating the protein, uh, translating the viral genes into protein, those proteins will spontaneously assemble into a capsid. The viral genome will go inside before the, or as the capsid is assembling, the viral genome will just be taken inside as well. And then when the, when the, when the virus leaves the cell, it basically tears a piece of the plasma membrane from the cell away with it and, and uses it, it wraps itself in a in, in the uh, cell, a piece of the cell's plasma membrane and leaves. And so for all intents and purposes, it gets out and it looks like another cell because it's wearing, you know, it's wearing the clothes of the cell. So it looks like a cell. 
Okay, now a special name, virion, is a virus particle outside the cell. So technically, we only call a virus a virus when it's inside the cell. If you have the, uh, the virus particle outside of the cell, it's referred to as a virion. All right, now how do we classify the viruses? This is based mostly on a system that was devised by a guy named David Baltimore, so it's called the Baltimore Classification System. David Baltimore is a professor of virology at the California Institute of Technology. I, I highly recommend the California Institute of Technology as one of the best technical, technical institutes, technical training facilities, and research facilities in the world. I really like Caltech. Uh, and he's there. So any of you that are ever fortunate enough to, to have to be in a position to go to California Institute of Technology, commonly known as Caltech, I strongly recommend you go there if you ever can. Okay, so David Baltimore um, invented the Baltimore classification system for classifying viruses. Okay, so they are based mainly on the genome, which we'll discuss in, in, in short order. But first of all, the viruses can be classified according to their capsid shape. There are three capsid shapes. Helical, I'll show you what that looks like later. Icosahedral, which is basically a golf ball shape, golf ball shape like the science world, which is down the street from Columbia College. It looks like a big, looks like a golf ball. And then complex, which means basically it's neither helical nor icosahedral. It's kind of a combination of both. Uh, and I'll show you examples. Okay, second, we classify them based on whether they are naked or enveloped. That means you just have a capsid versus you have a capsid that's surrounded with a phospholipid bilayer. And then thirdly, the main way to classify them is based on their genome. Do they have a DNA genome or do they have an RNA genome? And whether or not it's DNA or, or RNA, is it a single-stranded genome or is it a double-stranded genome? And then if it's a single-stranded genome, is it the plus or the minus strand? And I'll explain what that means as well. And then finally, is it, is the, does it have one chromosome or more? If it has more than one, we say that it has a segmented genome. Humans, for instance, have a segmented genome because we have 23 different chromosomes and we have two of each chromosome. So we, we, have, we have a segmented genome. Uh, some viruses do, but very few. Fortunately, very few viruses have segmented genomes. Otherwise, a lot more of them would be uh, of, a, of concern to us. But, but you know, most of them have a single chromosome. And then is the chromosome linear or circular? So does it have two loose ends or is it circle-shaped so it has no loose ends? All right, let's discuss the capsid shapes. The capsid is the case that carries the viral genome. It's made of identical protein subunits called capsomeres. They assemble spontaneously. The genome has already gone inside during the assembly, and we have three shapes, helical, icosahedral, and complex. Okay, so here, this is, a this is an icosahedral capsid. This is called adenovirus, which is a very small virus. And this is Ebola virus, which has a helical virus. And then if you have, if you have a, you know, a, a combination of a, of a helix and a, and a polyhedron, it's a complex shape. Sometimes you have a helical shape with a twist in it. Technically, the, e. Coli, sorry, the Ebola virus is a, is, is, a, is a complex capsid. This is rabies virus up here. It's one of the, it's a, it's a, it, uh, we'll talk about it later, but it, it's classified as having a complex capsid because it's kind of, they, they call it bullet shaped because it's flat on the bottom, it's, it's cylindrical in the middle, and then it's rounded at the top. So they say that it's complex or bullet shaped. Right, so it just means that it's not, it's neither helical nor uh, polyhedral, icosahedral. This is, this is bacteriophage M13, which is a helical virus. So it's just, it, it's just the viral genome is wrapped up with, with this into a helix so that it looks like a tube, right? So this is a prion, that's, a, that's something else entirely, don't worry. This is tobacco mosaic virus. Tobacco mosaic virus only infects the tobacco plant. So we don't worry about it too much unless we're farmers that are trying to grow tobacco. And if you're a farmer trying, trying to grow tobacco, shame on you because you're, you're in an evil profession. Uh, it causes people lung cancer and death and misery. Uh, try and grow something else instead of tobacco if you can. 
All right, so those are icosahedral, helical, and complex. Uh, by the way, you can see the general scale of viruses. If I haven't mentioned this before, viruses are very, very small. They're on the nanometer scale sometimes. So if a cell is typically 10 microns, viruses are 100 nanometers, you know, things, things in that range, 90 nanometers, 100 nanometers. You can see here this rhinovirus, which causes colds, is 30 nanometers in diameter. So they are very small. On the, on the upper right-hand side of this screen, we have a red blood cell, so you can see how big they are by comparison. Okay, so in a helical virus, the campsomeres spontaneously wrap themselves around the viral genome, forming, forming a helix like this. So that's basically the, the helical capsid. This is a, this is, to, this is an, these are electron microscope images of tobacco mosaic viruses. They're so small that uh, you have to use a, a special microscope technique called the shadowing technique. Basically, you, you spray stuff on the, on the slide and then you see the viruses where the, basically where the shadow is. Let's look at an icosahedral. So the capsomeres will spontaneously assemble into a polyhedral shape that's sort of like a soccer ball or a golf ball. So here you see a, a typical uh, polyhedral, icosahedral caps, capsid with the genome inside. On the right, we have, a, a, uh, we have a, a shadowing technique again that's showing the actual shape of the uh, icosahedral virus capsid. Now notice something here, these, th these little things that are sticking out on the edge are referred to here as spikes that are made of glycoproteins. Those spikes are what the virus uses to attach itself to host cells and then gain entry to host cells. And spikes is the common name because they look kind of like spikes coming out of a soccer ball or, or, or a helix. But the technical term for them is VAPs, or viral attachment proteins. And these spikes, these viral attachment proteins, usually mimic something that the cell has a, the host cell has a receptor for. So for instance, the AIDS virus, the HIV virus, which is called the, the human immunodeficiency virus, has viral attachment proteins that mimic a cytokine that binds to a receptor on the cell surface called the CD4 receptor. The CD4 receptor is only found on the surface of uh, T helper cells. And so that's, that is how the, the AIDS virus, the human immunodeficiency virus, is able to attach itself to T helper cells and get inside and then basically destroys the T helper cells, which cripples the immune system so that people who have AIDS um, often die of exotic forms of cancer that would not normally kill you. Those exotic, strange forms of cancer would normally be dealt with by a functional immune system. But because your immune system is coordinated by T helper cells and because the HIV virus gets into T helper cells and, and destroys them, uh, your immune system is crippled and uncoordinated. Uh, but anyway, most viruses have some types of viral attachment proteins on their surface that allows them to gain access to specific types of cells that have receptors that will bind to those viral attachment proteins. Okay, a complex capsid is a combination of other shapes. Bullet-shaped is one type that, that you have, or an icosahedron combined with a helix, for example. Right, so this, so this, this is interesting. This particular virus is called a bacteriophage. A bacteriophage is a virus that only attacks bacteria. And so, yes, there are some viruses that only attack humans. There's some viruses that attack only birds. There's some viruses that attack only bacteria, for instance. And a little interesting side note is that people are experimenting with bacteriophages as a method of killing bacteria as an alternative to antibiotics. So that's kind of an interesting subject we'll discuss later. All right, here's another compl complex uh, viral capsid. This is variola virus. Okay, so it, with a naked virus, the virus exits the cell with just the capsid. It usually gets into the cell using 
uh, receptor-mediated endocytosis, which we talked about at the beginning of the course, and then it usually exits the cell through simple exocytosis. So it uses the, the cell's machinery to get in and out, just like this. So the viral capsid, the, the protein capsid has viral attachment proteins on the surface, which attach themselves to receptors on the surface. The receptors on the surface of those cells are not there to allow viruses to get in. The receptors are there to receive signals in the form of cytokines and growth factors and hormones. But the viruses have figured out a way, well, they, they, they exploit this. I, I don't want to say they figured out a way because obviously they, they don't think, but they have adopted, uh, they have evolved to exploit the fact that cells have cytokine receptors on their surface and they have viral attachment proteins on their surface which will attach to those cytokine receptors which allow them to adhere to the cell and then get inside. This is an electron microscope, a TEM image showing viruses in the process of doing this, getting taken inside the cell through receptor-mediated endocytosis. Okay, an envelope virus, it exists, it, it, uh, it, it, when it exits the cell, it tears a piece of the host cell's plasma membrane out with it. It tears a piece of the host cell's plasma membrane, including the surface proteins like cytokine receptors and things, and it takes it away with it. So the virus is now, the, the viral genes are, are encased inside a capsid, and the capsid is encased inside a cell plasma membrane, basically. Okay, so here you see an envelope virus attaching to the surface, and what happens is that the, that, that the envelope, which was originally derived from a cell plasma membrane, will simply fuse with the cell plasma membrane and release the capsid and the genome inside. And then when it goes out, it simply does the opposite of what you see here. It bursts its way out and then takes a piece of the cell membrane with it, and then it has a, it's an envelope virus. Okay, so all three of the capsid types can be either naked or enveloped. I didn't want to give the impression that, uh, you know, only polyhedral viruses have envelopes and helical viruses don't. No, that's not true. Any, any of the capsid shapes can be either enveloped or naked. Okay, the viral attachment proteins, which are commonly called spikes, are used to for the virus to attach itself to the host cells and then gain entry. And so these viral attachment proteins are usually attaching themselves to receptors that are on the surface of cells, and those receptors are there to receive cytokine and uh, peptide signals from other cells. Uh, and so they're, they have basically ex they're exploiting the presence of these receptors on the surface in order to get inside. So what happens is that the viral attachment protein basically mimics the ligand for the cytokine receptors, and then the cell gets taken in through receptor-mediated endocytosis. And so here again, you just see a diagram, cartoon drawings showing the viral attachment proteins either on the surface of a naked virus here or on the, on the surface of an envelope virus here. Okay, so viruses have, hel have capsids that are either helical, icosahedral, or complex in shape. They can be either naked or enveloped. They may or may not have viral attachment proteins. They almost always do, but there are a few that don't, but generally they do. And they either gain entry through direct fusion with the envelope or through receptor-mediated endocytosis. All right, so you know that in higher, higher animals, in fact, every animal on Earth has a double-stranded DNA genome and either uh, usually linear chromosomes, bacteria have circular chromosomes, but they're made of double-stranded DNA, that's fine. So usually what happens is you have double-stranded, your genes are encoded by double-stranded DNA during uh, protein transcription and translation, you peel the two sides of the helix apart, so you have two single strands, and then you copy one of the strands, you make an RNA copy of one of the strands, 
That RNA copy is called messenger RNA. The messenger RNA is then loaded onto ribosomes, which translate the message into a protein by putting together a chain of amino acids. We call that the central dogma of molecular biology. And then we have the genetic code that reads uh, the three letter co the three bases in the codon of the messenger RNA and then puts together one amino acid after another after another accordingly in order to make the protein. Right, so we have double-stranded DNA in the nucleus or just in the nucleoid region if you're a bacteria. That that double-stranded DNA one strand is translated sorry is transcribed into messenger RNA. That messenger RNA is processed into a mature messenger RNA. It then goes out into the cytoplasm. It loads onto a ribosome and gets converted into a polypeptide. Eventually, the bigger polypeptide is classified as a protein. And we call that the central dogma of molecular biology, the fact that things always happen in this order. DNA is copied into RNA, RNA goes out and gets translated, DNA is transcribed into RNA, RNA is translated into protein, that's the way it works, no arguments, that's, that's the rule, the supreme law of the universe, which is what, what a dogma, dogmatism is, meaning the, the, in, an inflexible truth. Okay? In fact, like most, dog, like most dogmas, there are exceptions, and uh, it is not a universal truth. So viruses do a lot of weird things that, are, that do not follow the central dogma of molecular biology. Okay, viruses have many different types of genomes. They may have an RNA genome or a DNA genome, and regardless of whether it's RNA or DNA, it might be single-stranded or it might be double-stranded. Now, if it is single-stranded, you have to worry about whether it is a plus strand or a minus strand, a plus or a minus strand. Okay, so I will explain what that means. And then finally, you also have to worry in viruses, sometimes you have viruses that have a linear chromosome or circular chromosomes, and they may have more than one chromosome, in which case they have a segmented genome. Okay, now let me ask you some questions about genomes and translating RNA into proteins. Okay, so number one, what is normally transcribed? Right? When we talk about translation and transcription, transcription and translation, what is it that's transcribed? Okay, what is it that transcribes it? Okay, so first of all, what, what is normally transcribed is DNA. Right? So we have double-stranded DNA. What transcribes it? Right? In animal cells, in human cells, for instance, what transcribes it is RNA polymerase. Uh, bacteria have, have one RNA polymerase complex, and humans and other animals have three. Generally, uh, and, and, and the, it's a complex, right, an RNA polymerase. So RNA polymerase complex two, number two, we have RNA polymerase complex one, two, and three, humans do, and other animals. And it's usually RNA polymerase complex number two that translates most, uh, transcribes most of the common genes. Okay, where is what transcribes it located? Okay, so the, if, if it's RNA polymerase that's transcri transcribing the gene, where is it located? Well, it was already in the nucleus. Okay, it's already there. Where the DNA is, which is handy, right? And then it's loaded on. So, so what is it that's loaded onto the ribosome to be translated? Well, what's loaded on is a single-stranded piece of RNA, a messenger RNA, which happens to be plus what we classify as plus-stranded. So, let me explain further. All right. So, we have double. We have two strands of DNA in the nucleus. If you peel those two strands apart, one of the strands is copied, right? So if you look at one of the strands, it has the same base sequence as the messenger RNA will have, right? So you learned early on in biology that the start codon is AUG. There's an AUG start codon that also codes for methionine, right? So methionine is coded by AUG. If you look that, so the, the messenger RNA will have an AUG on it. If you look in the nucleus, there will be at the beginning of the gene in the nucleus, you'll see that it has ATG as the, as the start, right? But that's not what's copied because if you, if you copied the ATG, you would end up with TAC, wouldn't you? Or if it was RNA polymerase that you were copying, you'd end up with UAC, 
right? And that's not a start codon. That doesn't code for methionine. So instead, you don't code. So, so the, the strand of DNA that has ATG on it, which is ultimately going to be transcribed into AUG, which is going to be translated into protein. The DNA strand that has the ATG on it that matches the AUG in the messenger RNA, that is not the strand that's copied. But that strand is classified as the plus strand DNA. And then the strand that pairs with it that has the complementary sequence is the one that's copied. And we call that the minus DNA strand. Right? So the, the complementary strand, instead of having ATG on it, it has TAC on it. The RNA polymerase copies TAC into AUG and then all the other codons that follow it. That's what goes out into the nucleus to be, trans to be translated. Right, so in the nucleus, the negative DNA strand is copied. We end up then with a plus strand RNA, messenger RNA, and that is all done by RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase is a, what is known as a as a DNA dependent, uh, sorry, a DNA dependent RNA polymerase, because it uses a DNA template to make an RNA copy. Right. Okay, so then that messenger RNA goes out into the nucleus, and then it gets loaded onto a ribosome. So the RNA strand that gets loaded onto the ribosome is classified as a plus RNA strand because it contains the actual information that's going to be translated. It has UAG for a start codon, methionine, and so on. Okay, there are things that viruses do that are the opposite of that. There are some viruses that have a plus strand RNA genome. Those are easy because those you can load directly onto a ribosome to make more virus, uh, vir uh, viral proteins. But what do you do when you want to make more copies of the viral genome? Right? You need you need plus RNA plus strand RNA genome. We don't have anything that copies an RNA, a plus RNA strand. Humans and other animals don't have any enzymes. You know, I just said that RNA polymerase makes an RNA copy from a DNA template, but we don't have any enzymes that make an RNA copy from an RNA template. So generally, if viruses want to do that, if they want to, if they have to copy uh, a plus RNA strand and make co more copies of a plus RNA strand, they have to bring their own enzymes with them. And if they don't bring their own enzymes with them, at least they bring the gene for the enzyme. Uh, so one of the one of the enzymes that does that is an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which we're going to talk about later. Re reverse transcriptase takes an RNA genome and translates it, uh, transcribes it into a, a piece of DNA. So if you say that RNA polymerase which is the normal enzyme we have, and it exists in the nucleus. RNA polymerase is, an, is, is a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. That means that it makes an RNA copy from a DNA template. Reverse transcriptase does the reverse of that. It makes, an RNA, it makes a DNA copy of an RNA template. And that DNA copy then goes into the nucleus. It integrates or inserts itself into the nucleus, and then the RNA polymerase that's already in the nucleus will start making RNA copies of the DNA, which then get packaged into more viruses. So that's that's how uh, reverse transcriptase enzyme fits into that. Okay, there's some viruses that have an RNA strand, so obviously you cannot load those directly onto the ribosome, because the ribosome only takes a plus will only you know, you need a plus strand RNA, right? So obviously for viruses that have a minus RNA genome, you have to somehow make a plus strand copy or you make a DNA copy of the RNA and then the, R then the DNA copy is copied back into RNA by the cell, by the host cells RNA polymerase, right? If you have a double stranded RNA genome, you're basically in the same problem as the top two that we already discussed. And if you have a DNA genome, that's okay. It, that that has a lot less uh, problems associated with making copies of it. Okay, so how is the viral genome copied? DNA is replicated by a DNA-dependent DNA polymerase. That means when you want to make a copy of the DNA genome that humans have, we use DNA polymerase. And DNA polymerase makes a DNA copy from a DNA template. If we want to convert the genes in the DNA into proteins, then we use a we use a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. 
Right? And so what we do there is you make, a, you make an RNA copy from a DNA template. But we do not have any enzymes that make a DNA copy from an RNA template. If viruses want to do that, they have to bring the enzyme themselves, or they have to bring the gene for that enzyme. All right, so here's some interesting things to remember. A virus that has a plus-stranded RNA genome, as soon as it enters the cell, it can load itself directly onto a ribosome and start making its own proteins. Right? But So that part is easy. The first part is easy to make your own viral proteins inside a cell. That starts happening right away. But then how is the genome copied? Usually the, those types of, of viruses have to bring their own enzyme, a reverse transcriptase or something like that, with them. Okay, what about a minus strand RNA? Well, the minus strand RNA has to be copied into a plus strand RNA somehow and then loaded onto a ribosome to make viral proteins. Right. Okay, so minus strand RNA genomes are, tend to be copied into DNA and then they go to the nucleus and they insert themselves into the genome integration. They integrate. And we call those types of viruses retroviruses because they bring, they bring an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase, which is called reverse transcriptase. And retro means kind of backwards, right? So, so reverse transcriptase translates, makes a DNA copy from an RNA template. And we call the viruses, many of the viruses that bring that reverse transcriptase with it, we call them, we classify them as a type of virus called a retrovirus. Okay, then now some viruses have DNA genomes. Some of them go directly to the nucleus and they integrate into the genome. So integrate means they just jam themselves into one of the chromosomes. They, they stick themselves right into the chromosome so they're, they become a part of the chromosome. And this may shock you, but the, the, the people who study the human genome believe that Nearly 50%, 40-something 40, 40 percent of the human genome is the remnants of old viruses that have inserted themselves into the genome. Right, so that's a lot. So the human genome is a graveyard for 50% or 40% of the human genome is a graveyard for old viruses that have inserted themselves into our, into our genome over millions of years. Uh, but anyway, there are some viruses that don't actually insert themselves into the chromosome, and they exist as a little tiny separate chromosome, which is called an episome. Right? So you need to know the word episome. It's critical for virology. The word epi, of course, means above or beyond. Right? So an episome is like a chromosome, but it's above or separate from a chromosome. So the virus can be either stay in the genome and be replicated by DNA polymerase and RNA polymerases that are in the human genome, or they can stay out at, some of them stay, depending on the virus, some of them stay out in the cytoplasm and they get replicated there. Okay, so once the virus gets inside the cell, what does it do? So if you if you're an RNA virus versus a DNA virus, do you have to convert into RNA and so on? Once you're there, do you stay in the cytoplasm or do you go to the nucleus? Right, that's another critical question. Right, so as I said, there's some DNA viruses that go to the nucleus and they integrate into the chromosomes in the nucleus at a random spot. There are other viruses that have a DNA genome and they stay as an episome in the nucleus. There are there are yet other viruses that remain as an episome in the cytoplasm, in which case they have to bring their own DNA polymerases and RNA polymerases because in the human cell, in a host cell, for instance, the RNA polymerase and the DNA polymerase is not in the cytoplasm. They're in the nucleus. Uh, so the word episome, an episome is an independently replicating miniature chromosome. It's kind of like a plasmid for a bacteria, except that in this case we're talking about animal cells, uh, you know, things, uh, it's independent chromosomes living inside animal cells. All right, let's look at a few examples. Variola virus causes a terrible disease called smallpox. Um, and it has a linear double-stranded DNA genome, and it remains as an episome in the cytoplasm. So it, it has a double-stranded DNA genome. It's linear. It does not enter the 
uh, it does not enter the nucleus. It just stays as an episome in the cytoplasm, causes smallpox. Okay, HPV-16 causes cervical cancer in women and, and genital warts. It's a sexually transmitted disease. Um, it has a circular double-stranded DNA genome that does go into the nucleus and integrates. It inserts itself into the chromosome uh, any, anywhere, right? Generally, viruses that do this, that insert themselves into the host cell chromosomes, will insert themselves any place. Uh, they have... They, they tend to insert themselves in certain places more than others, but, but not, a lot, not, not that often to, to be predictable. They generally insert themselves at semi-random places in the genome. Okay, HHV1 stands for human herpes virus 1. It causes herpes, which is another sexually transmitted disease. It has a linear double-stranded DNA genome that goes to the nucleus, but it does not integrate into the nucleus. It remains as an episome in the nucleus. Okay, poliovirus causes poliomyelitis, or in some cases, paralysis. It was a terrible uh, virus that was the scourge of the human race up until we invented the polio vaccine. Uh, it, the, the poliovirus has a plus strand, single-stranded RNA genome that remains as an episome in the cytoplasm. Okay, then finally, a, another example down here at the bottom, the human immunodeficiency virus that causes the AIDS syndrome. AIDS stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, uh, it, it, and it's caused by the human immunodeficiency virus. It has a plus-stranded, single-stranded RNA genome that comes with a reverse transcriptase enzyme, so it is reverse translated into DNA. The DNA goes to the nucleus and integrates into the genome. So these are five different examples of five different viruses with five different types, slightly different types of genomes that do five different things once they get into the cell. So uh, you should probably memorize these because right, these are some, some critical important examples of viruses. All right, let's look at what David Baltimore did in order to classify all these viruses together. Okay, so class one, type a type one virus, right, has a double-stranded DNA, a, a double-stranded DNA genome. A type, a Baltimore type two virus has a single-stranded DNA genome. A Baltimore type three virus has a double-stranded RNA genome. A Baltimore type 4 virus has a single-stranded RNA, uh, a plus single-stranded RNA genome. A Baltimore type 5 virus has a minus strand single-stranded RNA genome. Baltimore type 6 virus has a single-stranded RNA genome that is reverse, trans, uh, uh, reverse transcribed into DNA. And a Baltimore class, a Baltimore type seven virus has a double-stranded DNA, a double-stranded DNA uh, genome that is reverse transcribed anyways into an RNA intermediate and then back into a DNA. So it's kind of a uh, an extra redundant step that that a type seven virus carries out. So it's it's already double-stranded DNA. And for some bizarre reason, it translates, it reverse transcribes, it reverse transcribes itself into uh, uh, RNA, and then re and then transcribes, reverse transcribes itself again into, or for I guess you would classify that as forward trans uh, transcription because it's going from double stranded DNA to RNA, and then it reverse transcribes itself back into DNA again, and that often integrates into the chromosome. Okay, so let's see if we can classify the viruses we just talked about according to the Baltimore classification system. Uh, you can stop the recording if you want and see if you can do that. Otherwise, I'll go through it with you right now. Okay, here we go with the answers. All right, so the variola virus, the HPV-16, and the human herpes virus 1 are all classified as Baltimore type 1 viruses because they all have a double-stranded DNA genome. So that's really all that we care about at this point. All right, so the Baltimore classification system is only based on the type of genome you have. Okay, the polio virus is classified as a type 4 because it has, it has a plus single-stranded RNA genome. 
And then the AIDS virus, the HIV virus, is classified as a type 6 because a, t a Baltimore type 6 virus because it has a plus, a plus single-stranded RNA genome that is reverse translated into DNA. Right, so Baltimore type 1, type uh, 4, and type 6. That's what these examples are. Just as an amusing little anecdote, I'm sure you know who this is on the right. Most of you probably know who this is on the left. Right, so on the on the right, we have Donald Trump, who's the president of the United States at the time of my recording this this lecture. Bill Gates, of course, is the founder of Microsoft, and Bill Gates is a multi-billionaire, and he he uh, donates a lot of money to research on two types of viruses. One is that he donates a lot of money to research on HPV-16, and he also donates a lot of research on HIV. Uh, and he, I saw him doing a TED Talk once where he mentioned the fact that he met with Donald Trump once in 2016, and he told them about HPV-16 and HPV HIV, and Donald Trump said that he thought they were the same thing. What's the difference? And so Gates, uh, Gates carefully explained to him that one of them you know, all these differences, one of them, you know, one is a has a DNA genome and one of them, ca one of them causes cervical cancer and the other one causes immune, causes AIDS, right? And so fair enough. And then Trump seemed to understand that. And then he saw him a year later or something and he had to explain the whole thing over again because uh, Donald Trump didn't remember any of that. Uh, so anyway, now you, you do, hopefully, you know the difference between HPV-16 and HIV and you'll, you'll know the difference very well by the time we get to the end of this lecture and the next lecture. Okay, here's an interesting thing, which is that the capsid is very small. And uh, so viruses, if viruses have to fit their genes into a very small space, and so they do a lot of really interesting tricks that other organisms don't have to worry about. You know, if you have, if you have a really big house, you don't have to worry about accumulating a lot of things that you don't use very often because you have room for it. You have a basement, you, you clutter up the basement with stuff. That's kind of what the human genome is like. We have all of this so-called junk DNA that we're not quite sure what it does. Usually only about 5% of the human genome is actually codes for proteins. The other 95%, we're not exactly sure what it does, but we know that around 40% of it is the remnants of old proviruses. Um, viruses don't have that luxury. They live in a very small apartment they have to find two or three uses for everything they have so they do a lot of very interesting tricks they have multiple open reading frames uh, they have reading frames that if, if you have a double-stranded DNA genome for instance a lot of viruses or a double-stranded RNA genome the viruses will have coding sequences on both strands both the plus and the minus strand will code for proteins that are used by the virus uh, another thing, another interesting thing that many viruses have is they have their genes have very strong promoters, and they have their genes have very strong enhancers, right? So, those of you, if you remember your biology 110, you remember that a gene has a thing at the front part of the gene on the five prime end of a gene. You have the promoter, and there are weak promoters and strong promoters. A weak promoter is not transcribed very often. A strong promoter is transcribed all the time. And there are thing, other D, pieces of DNA, other DNA sequences either that, that, are either, that either come before or after the gene that will actually assist the promoter in starting transcription from that gene. And so those are called enhancers. Right? So viruses tend to have very strong promoters with very strong enhancers. Now, I mentioned the fact that some viruses will integrate into the host cell chromosome. And when they do that, they bring their strong promoters and their strong enhancers with them. And in, in particularly of interest are the strong enhancers, because what that happens is the strong enhancers will kind of mess up the expression pattern or the translation pattern of any genes, host cell genes that are located nearby. Right, so you might, if one of these viruses inserts itself next to a gene that's not transcribed very often, that virus will probably cause that gene to be transcribed all the time. And that may cause a problem. It may or may not cause a problem. Uh, and, and so one problem that it could cause is cancer, for instance, because cancer is caused by, uh, generally speaking, um, 
you know this, that, that most of the cells in the adult human body are not dividing. Cells do not divide unless they're told to divide. Your cells are dividing a lot when you're developing in the womb, when we're all developing in the womb. Then after we're born, most of our cells are not dividing. There are only a few cells that are dividing. Generally, the, the cells in your hair follicles are dividing. The cells in your skin are dividing. The cells in, that line your gut are dividing and the bone marrow cells are dividing, but most of the other cells are not because they, they haven't been told to divide. Uh, other cells will send messages and tell you to divide, and then you're not supposed to divide until you receive the signal to divide. So what happens when you receive the signal is that there are out of the, out of the 23,000 genes in the human genome, there are something like 5,000 or something, uh, there, or well, not, not even that many, probably something like 300 or something like that that are involved proteins, the genes that code for proteins that control cell division. And so those genes that control cell division are usually turned off because you don't want the cell to divide unless it's told to divide. If one of these viruses integrates near one of those cell control genes, it will turn it on and then the cell could conceivably divide and keep on dividing uncontrollably and that's when you have cancer. So you have cancer when the regulation, when the genes that control cell division are turned on when they're not supposed to be turned on, and they were, and they were not turned on in response to any signal. They were turned on because something happened to them. They got mutated or because a virus integrated nearby or something like that. So viruses are important for that reason as well. Uh, but what I started out talking about here was the fact that they also do a lot of interesting tricks with their genome. They have open reading frames in both directions. Uh, they have, they generally do not have introns, right? So most higher organisms have introns. Viruses don't because they don't have room for those. Um, and they have strong promoters attached to most of their genes, which can be a problem sometimes for us. Okay, so some of these tricks, they have no introns. They have multiple overlapping reading frames. Now, what that means is that if you start from the first ATG, if you start from the first ATG in the genome, you make one protein. If you cover up the first two bases in the codon and then you start again from the next ATG you run into, you, you run into another uh, open reading frame. And both of those open reading frames are used. So that's the analogy I like to use is it's sort of like if you have a novel Right. Imagine you're reading a novel and there's a story that makes sense and then you go to the first page of the novel and you cover up the first two letters of the first word and then you start reading and it, it gives you a completely different novel that has a different story. That sounds incredible but that's kind of like that's kind of what many of the genes do in a virus where you have multiple overlapping reading frames so you have genes coding sequences in two or three different reading frames within the same sequence of DNA and all of that is necessary to save space because they don't have much space inside the viral capsid. Okay, so we mentioned the fact that viral genomes are replicated in the host cells. DNA sustains random mutations over time because the DNA is not copied perfectly. There, once in a while, you make an error when you're copying the DNA with the DNA polymerases. But there are DNA enzymes, there, there are enzymes that proofread the DNA and correct the errors, right? So we mentioned the fact that there are no RNA proofreading enzymes, which means that RNA accumulates mutations more quickly, which means that the proteins that are encoded by viruses are constantly changing because they're accumulating changes in their genome so quickly. And that's, that, of course, is what we call, uh, what we call genetic drift, or what, yeah, what we call genetic drift. So the viruses with RNA genomes mute at a very quick rate. Uh, the viral proteins, the capsimeres and the viral attachment proteins change very quickly and the immune system has, to, has a hard time keeping up with them. And that's why there's a new cold every, every, now, every now and then. Uh, we mentioned the fact that, that um, um, uh, if you have multiple versions of the same organism that you identify and you, it's common practice to identify the multiple versions, uh, if you have multiple versions of a bacteria, for instance, you would probably call them strains, but you can also call them serovars, because serovar, the word var and serovar means variant, 
and the word sero refers to serology. The word serology refers to the use of antibodies to identify things or to, to identify things based on antibodies which are present in the blood serum. So serology is the study of antibodies present in blood serum or the use of antibodies to identify things. Right. So there happen to be a hundred uh, cold viruses are colds are caused by a type of virus called a rhinovirus. Rhino is the Latin word for nose. Right, so that's why a rhinoceros has the name that it has because it has this big horn on its nose. So rhinoviruses cause colds. Rhinoviruses have an RNA genome. It's a single strand, a uh, single chromosome RNA genome, so we don't have to worry about chromosome reassortment. But there are a hundred different serovars. There are more than a hundred different variations of the cold virus. And in fact, we never catch the cold, the same cold virus twice. We always catch a different serovar. Right, so that so that's called antigenic drift, or genetic drift, or antigenic drift, which is a result of having an RNA genome. Okay, if you have segmented genome, and if you're an RNA virus, makes it particularly bad because not only can you do genetic or antigenic drift, but you can do antigenic shift, which is co-infection followed by reassortment of the chromosome. So due to the mutations, some chromosomes you know, you have different alleles of different viral genes. And if a person is co-infected or an animal is co-infected with two different strains of the same virus, the chromosomes may get reassorted before packaging. And that's why you end up getting a totally different, a very fast change in several of the proteins on the surface of that particular virus because you've, you've rearranged the chromosomes. Okay, now I'm, I want to talk to you about two new concepts called viral tropism and host range. Basically, viral tropism refers to what types of tissues or what types of cells does that particular virus like to infect. And that, that is usually determined by what viral attachment proteins are present on the surface of the virus. Because remember, the viral attachment proteins are attaching to specific cytokines and speci specific cytokine receptors, rather. And specific cytokine receptors are only present on the surface of some certain types of cells, right? So you have, you know, these receptors are present on these cells, and those receptors are present on another type of cell, and that is, and and that's what determines viral tropism because the virus is going to attach to certain cytokine receptors. Right? Okay, the host range refers to what animals or what organisms does the virus infect. For example, there are some viruses that, that only infect humans, and we say that those viruses have a narrow host range because they only infect one type of animal, one species, humans. And there are other viruses that infect not only humans, but pigs and birds. That's why we call it the swine flu, because it infects pigs. That's why we call it the the bird uh, bird flu because it infects birds as well. So if you have a virus that it, that can infect several different types of animals, we say that it has a broad host range. Okay, so viral tropism. Viral tropism refers to which tissues that the virus will infect. Will it does it infect lung tissues? Does it infect skin tissues and so on? Does it infect liver tissues? versus host range, which is asking what animals does it infect? Does it have a narrow host range and just infect humans, or does it have a broad host range and infect humans, pigs, chickens, and other things? Okay, so the viral host range refers to what animals it can infect, <clears throat> humans, birds, and so on, cows. And viral tropism refers to which tissues does the virus like to invade? Does it infect ner nervous tissue? In which case, the word tropism, if a virus in, infects nervous tissue, it, it usually adheres to the nervous tissue using certain spikes on the surface, viral attachment proteins. If we have a virus that attaches to nervous tissue, we say that it is, it is neurotrophic. And the word tropism is in there, right? So a neurotrophic virus attacks or attaches itself to neurons. A hepatotrophic virus attaches itself to hepatocytes or liver, liver cells. An ep epitheliotrophic, epitheliotrophic virus attaches itself to epithelial cells, and you know that skin cells are epithelia. The lung, lining of the lungs are epithelial cells. So for example, a lot of um, 
respiratory viruses that infect the lungs are classified as epitheliotropic viruses because they specifically like to uh, attach themselves to the squamous cell epithelia, squamous cell epithelial cells that are present inside the lung cells. Okay, and then finally, we have to concern ourselves with the portal of entry. Do they get in through the oral fecal route? Do they get in through the parenteral route? Do they get in through some other route? Okay, so once again, viral tropism is where do these viruses like to live? What, I mean, what, what tissue do they like to infect? And what tissues and organs do they do damage to based on the viral tropism? And then the host range, is it broad versus narrow host range? How are they transmitted? Are they transmitted through a vector? Are they transmitted through droplet transmission? Are they transmitted through skin-to-skin -skin contact? All of these things that we discussed during the, during the lecture on epidemiology. How infectious, how contagious are they? We can figure that out by calculating the, the r naught value. What is the, what is the morbidity rate versus the mortality rate? Uh, and the r naught value determines how infectious and contagious it is. How deadly are they? Of course, that will be determined. You can calculate that from the mortality rate. Remember that the, the morbidity rate is what percentage of the entire population has this disease, this virus, for instance. And then the mortality rate is calculated by uh, what percentage of the people that have it die from it. It's actually not, uh, I think I might have made a mistake in one of the note sets where I said that the mortality rate is the number of people in the population that die from it. That's actually not true. The mortality rate is how many people who have the disease die from it, right? That's what the mortality rate is. So you may have a disease that has a very small morbidity rate. It only infects 0.01% of the population, but has a very high mortality rate, which means that even though it only infects 0.1% of the population, it kills 100% of the people that it infects. Right? That's the opposite of a cold, for instance, that has a very high morbidity rate most of the time. So in the winter time, you get this like a third of the people in, a, in an area catch the same cold, but very few of them will die from it. So that would be an example of a virus that has a very high morbidity rate and a very low mortality rate. Okay, so just some a couple of examples of what's going on here. Examples of epitheliotrophic cells that infect skin cells, the HPV viruses cause warts and cervical cancer, and the human herpes virus is epitheliotrophic because it likes to infect skin cells uh, and, and causes blisters. But the HHV, the human herpes virus, is a little bit deceptive because it also happens to be neurotrophic, so it lives in neurons as well. Now below that category, we have some other neurotrophic viruses that live in nerves. The Lisa viruses are, cause rabies. They, live in, they like to live in nerves. The polio virus likes to live in nerves, and then the varicella zoster virus, which causes chickenpox, likes to live in neurons as well, and we'll discuss how that works. Okay, hepatotrophic viruses. Hepatotrophic viruses would be H uh, hepatitis A virus, hepatitis B virus, and hepatitis C virus. These are three viruses that generally, they, they get into the body and they, they attack the liver, so that they cause hepatitis. Remember that we discussed the fact that you take the, if you talk about an organ being inflamed, you take the name of the organ and then you add itis to the end. So hepatitis viruses cause the liver to be inflamed. Okay, and then we have a lot of respiratory viruses that, that they like to infect the epithelial cells that line the inside of the lungs. Okay, so coronavirus, uh, which is why we're, we're, we're doing this class by remote learning at the moment, it is a respiratory virus. So are rhinoviruses that cause colds and influenza virus. Influenza A, for instance, causes the flu. Okay, so this is just a few examples of viral tropism. What cells do they like to live in? What about some examples, examples of virus host range? Okay, so some viruses have a narrow host range. The polio virus only infects humans, and the Epstein-Barr virus, which causes a disease called mononucleosis, that is, mononucleosis is also known as the kissing disease. Uh, the kissing disease is, you know, that's usually the way most people catch it, 
Um, it causes a disease called mononucleosis. Those two viruses affect only humans. They infect only humans. So, so there are no animal reservoirs for mononucleosis, no animal reservoirs for Epstein-Barr virus, no animal reservoirs for poliovirus. There are other viruses that have a broad host range. So influenza, for instance, has a very broad host range. It, it can infect humans, birds, pigs, cattle, and a few other types of animals. Coronavirus, unfortunately, has a broad host range. It can infect humans, birds, bats, pigs, and cows, and a few other animals. The reason why that's, that, that's a nasty habit to have, a nasty characteristic to have, is because it means that even if you cure all of the humans who've caught that virus, you can't get rid of it because there will still be animals that have it. Right? So even if all of the humans that had the virus either die or are cured, you still can't rid it, get rid of the virus because animals will have it. And then you can get it from animals and animals can get it from humans. That's not the same for a narrow host range virus because once if, if you have a narrow host range virus, everybody, if every human who's ever got polio either gets cured or dies out either from old age or from the polio disease, the, the disease will essentially be eradicated, right? So the eradicate, eradication means that it's not available for anyone to, to catch anymore, for anyone to contract it anymore. Okay, so broad host range viruses tend to be bad for that reason because it's very difficult to get rid of them because even if you cure all the humans that have caught that virus, there will still be animals that have it. There will still be non-human reservoirs for that virus. Okay, looking at influenza, for instance, these are all the animals that can be infected with influenza. Influenza has a segmented genome where there are eight chromosomes, and on those eight chromosomes, there are two important genes that are on two of the chromosomes. One of the, one of the genes codes for a protein called hemagglutinin, and that's sim, uh, symbolized by the letter H. And one of, them, one of the proteins is called neuro, uh, neuraminidase, which is symbolized by the letter N. And it just so happens that if you take all the influenza strains in the world, there are 18 different alleles of the hemagglutinin uh, gene. And there are 11 different alleles of the neuraminidase gene. Right? So if you have a segmented genome, it's possible, theoretically it's possible that these things can keep on recombining in, in uh, animals or people that have been co-infected until we get every possible combination of the 18 H's and the 11, 18 different H's and 11 different N's. Um, I'm not a mathematician, but there is a formula that you can use to calculate how many combinations that is. And I, I haven't calculated it, but it's a lot of different combinations. And so we haven't even gone through them yet. Now, there's some people that are working on vaccines for, for influenza, and their idea is that we, could, we should just be able to make all 11 proteins of the, uh, that correspond to the 11 neura neuraminidase uh, alleles, and we should be able to make all 18 of the hemagglutinin allele proteins, and we should just be able to inject all of those in people so that we're, we're immune to any possible combination, and then humans will no longer have to suffer from influenza. And so there are people who are working on that right now uh, with limited degrees of success, uh, but that's what they're working on. Okay, so one of the reasons why inf influenza is particularly nasty is because it can change the proteins on its surface quite quickly through chromosome reassortment, which is called antigenic shift, uh, which we talked about before. Okay, now what about why, why, why another reason why influenza is so bad is because one of the ways that we can control it, which, which we need to start doing in the future, is to, if, if, Influenza can infect, it has a broad host range and it can infect humans as well as animals. We have to make sure that fewer humans are in contact with the animals that can also catch influenza. Right. So there are two ways that people, you know, if you have pig farms and bird farms, you know, chicken farms, turkey farms, and so on, and cow farms, there, there are not a lot of people who are in contact with all of those animals. Right? And so when what they do basically is the farmer then kills those animals and brings the meat to the market, and, but the, the actual customers were not in contact with the live animals. 
On the other hand, there are many places in the world where people go to live markets and they, they like to inspect the animals when they're alive before they buy them, and we call those wet markets. And that means that lots of different people come in contact with the animals and then lots of live animals and then lots of people have the opportunity to catch respiratory viruses from live animals and so on. Right, so if you confine all of these animals to the farm when they're alive, if somebody's going to get sick, it's only going to be the farmer. And as bad as that is, that may be bad, but at least it can be contained that way because it's not going to be suddenly spread among hundreds of people who went through the market as opposed to live markets where people come around and they look they like to look at the live chickens before they decide which one to buy uh, uh, we generally don't have live markets here in Canada but even if you go to restaurants you can buy live shellfish you know like you're in a seafood restaurant and they have live crabs in a in an aquarium they probably shouldn't do that uh, someday that's going to be a problem. At the moment, there aren't any viruses that can cross over between crabs and humans, but if they ever do, then having live crabs in the seafood store, in the seafood restaurant, is going to be a problem, and they'll have to stop doing that. You won't be able to go to the seafood store and choose your own crab anymore. Okay, so just some examples. We're going to go through all of these in detail in the next lecture, but some viruses are transmitted by vector, right? So the Zika virus and the yellow fever virus are two viruses that are transmitted by mosquito vectors. Many of them are transmitted through the oral fecal route, including the polioviruses. Many of them are transmitted through skin-to-skin -skin contact, often sexual contact. The human papillomavirus and the human herpes viruses are two examples. And then there are a lot of them that are transmitted through droplet transmission or fomite transmission. So the coronaviruses, which includes COVID-19, influenza virus, rhinovirus, variola virus, varicella zoster virus, measles, mumps, and rubella are all transmitted through droplet, usually through droplet transmission, occasionally through fomite transmission. So all of these that are that are droplet trans, transmission tend to be highly contagious. We have vaccines for some, but not all of them. Right? So we do have vaccines for some of the strains of the flu. Uh, we don't have vaccines for all the strains of the coronavirus. Obviously, if we did, we wouldn't be in this situation of teaching this class by remote teaching because we, we would have all been vaccinated against COVID-19 by now. But we do have very good, very effective vaccinations against variola virus, varicella zoster, measles, mumps, and rubella. In fact, our vaccine against variola virus, which causes smallpox, was so good and so successful that it's now classified as having been eradicated and people no longer have to be vaccinated against variola virus because it's not around for people to catch anymore. So variola virus is kind of interesting. We're going to talk more about it next time, but it was actually brought by the Europeans to the New World. And many people of the, the, the Native Americans, the, the, native, uh, the native groups that were inhabiting North America were killed off by the European settlers that brought variola virus to which they were already immune. Uh, also, the same is true for the South Pacific. South Pacific Islanders were killed off en masse by Europeans accidentally, not intentionally, but accidentally bringing a virus to which they had no immunity. Okay, so that's variola virus, which is, variola virus is potentially quite deadly. It has a, uh, it, it has um it has a mortality rate of around 40% or something like that. So that means half the people who get variola virus will die from it. Uh, the other ones below that, varicella zoster, measles, mumps, and rubella, do not have a terribly high mortality rate, but they are very contagious, and they tend to infect mostly children. Okay, so I'm going to show you some slightly disturbing images now of children who have measles, mumps, and rubella. So there are vaccines again. These these viruses. Um, the one in the middle here is is mumps. I recognize it because I I had the mumps when I was a child, and it was uh, it's not often lethal, but boy was it ever unpleasant. I can still remember it now. I was only about four years old or something when I got the mumps, and uh, and uh, it was extremely uh, painful. 
but but anyway, um, there are very effective vaccines against measles, mumps, rubella, and varicella zoster. Generally, people in the in 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 Europe and North America get vaccinated, get the MMRV vaccine on their first birthday. Uh, so then this is about the, on the first birth, first birthday is about the time. So they try to give you this vaccine before you start interacting with other children, because in the old days before the vaccines, children would break out and these they would transmit these diseases around to each other fairly quickly uh, when they started being in school or in daycare centers together. So they would in infect them quickly so that they don't spread them around as soon as children start playing with each other in groups. Okay, so rubella, of course, you already know that if a pregnant woman contracts rubella, her baby could be born with congenital rubella syndrome, which is very serious. It's accompanied by microcephaly, small head, uh, and mental retardation because of due to the small head, uh, problems with the heart, coarctation of the aorta, problems with vision, cataracts on the eyes, and uh, rashes, petechial rashes. All right, so all of these things are transmitted by droplet. How contagious are they versus how deadly? All right, so we know the difference between a communicable and a contagious disease. We know the difference between the mortality rate and the morbidity rate, and we know the we know the the meaning of the R not value. That means how many people will an infected person infect themselves? Generally, if the R not value is less than one, the disease is self-limiting. It, it will die out by itself. If the R not value is greater than one, it's going to spread. If it's greater than two or three, it'll spread. Okay, so we mentioned the fact that the incubation period is the period during which it, it, it the the length of each of these periods is variable and dependent on different types of viruses, but the incubation period is the period where a person doesn't have any symptoms, but they're still contagious. And the length of the incubation period and the number of viruses that you are shedding, as they call it, like when you're, when you're, you know, viruses are coming off of you and, and infecting other people, they say that you're shedding virus. So during the incubation period, you have no symptoms, so you don't know that you're sick, and so you can't stay home in order to avoid infecting people. And that, and Generally, viruses with longer incubation periods tend to be more more contagious because you go around spreading it to more people before you realize you're sick and stay home. Okay, so you're contagious, but you don't feel sick during the incubation period. Okay, so one of the ways that you can deal with this if you have a particularly bad virus is you can just say if it's a droplet transmitted virus like coronavirus, you just make a law that everyone has to wear a mask. And that way they can't be talking to each other and spraying the virus around. Some people erroneously think that the mask is there to protect them from the virus. It's not. The mask is there to protect you from contaminating other people during the incubation period when you don't know that you're sick. Right. So if any of your friends or relatives don't know that that's the purpose of the mask mandates, that is the reason why. So the mask is not there to protect you from getting sick. The mask is there to protect you from infecting other people during the incubation period. Right. So this is one way to contain a virus. Even if we don't have a vaccine that prevents spread of the virus, we can contain it. If, if it's a respiratory droplet transmission virus like coronavirus, one of the ways that we contain it contain it is to stop people from spreading it during the incubation period by simply forcing everyone to wear a mask. Uh, most of you know that in some parts of the world, particularly in Asia, like Japan, China, South Korea, and so on, it's a habit that people have that they go to work when they're sick. Those are work while sick societies, meaning that um, a work while sick society is a society where people expect you to come to work even when you're sick, which is a, a very foolish attitude. Um, it's a, it's a self-defeating attitude because then you make other people sick. But the deal is that you come to work when you're sick anyway. If you have a mild cold, nobody allows you to, people don't expect you to stay at home because you have a cold. They expect you to put on a mask and come to work and you put on the mask so that you won't infect anyone else. That's fine if you're only dealing with colds because colds are not lethal. And so you might infect a few people because you went to work when you didn't realize you were sick. And, but, you know, some people, a few people get a cold that's not going to kill them. But 
coronavirus might. So therefore, we have to do things like make these mask laws that everyone has to wear a mask when they're outside, when they're in public spaces, in order to contain the spread of the disease during the incubation period and the prodromal phase. There are ways that you can test to see if somebody has a disease. The polymerase chain reaction is a very sensitive way that looks for the presence of viral genes, right? So the polymerase chain reaction can be used to test whether or not somebody has a viral disease, uh, respiratory disease during the incubation period. The downside is that PCR tests tend to be fairly expensive. Um, the more of them you do, the less expensive they will be because of the, the cost, you know, uh, economy of scale, right? So the more of them you do, they can be mass produced and then they become cheaper. That's fine. Okay, so if you wait for looking for symptoms, then you have actually allowed a lot of people to get infected. But symptoms are something that you can easily check. So for you've probably seen this happening somewhere. Uh, people are forbidden from getting onto airplanes if they have a fever. So here you have a guard at the airport who's using an infrared thermometer to measure. The, they point this thermometer at your forehead and it tells you if you have a fever. If you have a fever, then you might have coronavirus, so you're not allowed to get on the airplane. Right? So you're checking people here, right? but you're letting all of these people get on the plane. Right? So it's, this is not perfect, but it's cheap, and you can do it with a lot of people. You can, you can get everyone to line up on their way into the airplane, and you can check their temperature. Uh, so that is better than, it's much better than nothing. Right? It's much better than nothing. So you get everyone to wear a mask, that's better than nothing. You take everyone's temperature in roadblocks and airport lineups, again, that's better than nothing. If you do a lot of these small measures that are small but cheap and easy, eventually you'll make a big enough difference that you can slow down and even stop the disease, which is the idea. Okay, so generally when you quarantine people, like the COVID-19, COVID-19 has an incubation period of two weeks, and so you set a quarantine period to match, uh, if you don't have a way to test, then you quarantine people who have symptoms, and then you quarantine the people who've been in contact with those people for a period of time that matches the incubation period. Right? So the quarantine period is usually to match, designed to match the incubation period for a specific virus. Right? So quarantine, quarantine was. Uh, it was actually in the, the, the quarantine, it comes from the Italian word quarantina, which means 40 days, 40 days. And it was invented basically by the Italians, particularly in, in Venice, who, who, was a, who, who received ships from all over the world carrying cargoes. If the ship came, uh, do, came to their dock and there was plague on board or fever or something, they would say, okay, nobody's allowed to leave the ship for quarantina for 40 days. So the quarantine period is meant to match the incubation period for a particular disease. So COVID-19 has a 14, 2 to 14 day incubation period, which means if, you, if you've been in contact with somebody that has COVID-19 and you don't have a PCR test or there's no way to measure whether you have the virus or not, you simply have to isolate yourself, be isolated for two weeks. And after two weeks, if you don't show any of the signs of the disease, then you're assumed to be disease free and you can go out. Okay, so COVID-19 has, has a quarantine period and an incubation period of 14 days. Um, notice the, there, there are two, we've had two other outbreaks of the SARS coronavirus in the last 20 years. The other two uh, ended up, they had, they had higher mortality rates, but um, they kind of, we're, we're in isolated areas and they kind of died out, fortunately. Uh, the, I think the jury is still out. We're still trying to figure out the exact r naught value for COVID-19. I guess we'll fill, figure it out eventually. But look at some of these other diseases that we, other viral diseases that we just discussed. Smallpox, measles, mumps, rubella, and influenza, they have higher r naught values. Right? So just look at measles here. Measles is the king of contagion. 
right? So it's not terribly, it doesn't have a terribly high mortality rate. In fact, this, I've got an asterisk beside the 10%. Uh, measles is 10%, has a mortality rate of 10% if it's untreated, but it's almost always treated. And so there's some various ways you can treat the measles. Mumps and rubella have a very low mortality rate, but again, they have a high uh, contagious rate. They do occasionally, even when they don't result in death of the child who catches it, they sometimes result in deafness or blindness. And those two things are bad enough that it's worthwhile to not to, to take steps in order to avoid your child from catching mumps or measles, mumps, or rubella. But measles is a particularly bad one because it has a long incubation period and a very high r naught value, which means it's very easy to spread from one person to the next. Fortunately, we have uh, vac vaccines that will stop all of those. Right? Influenza has a relatively short incubation period, right? So uh, you stay, you know, after two days being exposed, two days after being exposed to the flu, if you catch the flu, you'll be in bed. You can't work when you're sick because the flu is generally too bad. It's just it, it causes you to, be, to, to feel so bad that there's no way you could go to work even if you wanted to, even if your boss threatened to fire you for staying home, you couldn't go to work. Okay, so we do have uh, we do have vaccines against measles, mumps, rubella, uh, in, and then seasonal influenza. We come out with a new vaccine every year. Uh, some years they're more effective than others. Okay, now let's return to the characteristics of viruses and briefly discuss the difference between a lytic and a lysogenic virus. Okay, so a lytic virus is, as I said, a lytic virus is a virus that produces a lot of progeny viruses and it destroys the host cell on the way out. These viruses destroy tissues, so they tend to cause blisters and sores and sometimes hemorrhagic fevers. Hemorrhagic means that you bleed on the inside due to destruction of the blood vessels and capillaries, right? So those are lytic viruses. Example, the Ebola virus or the herpes virus, for instance, those are lytic viruses. Lysogenic or temperate viruses produce only a few progeny viruses. Progeny means children, right? So you produce progeny viruses. That means the offspring of the original virus, right? So you so so they produce progeny viruses at a slow rate, which does not destroy the cell. Sometimes the, these viruses even go into a dormant or a latent phase, which means that they completely hide. They go into hiding and they don't make any noise and they don't make a fuss and they don't produce any more viruses and they, they don't reappear sometimes for decades. Right? So example of a latent virus is varicella zoster virus. And so varicella zoster virus, you get it as a child and you break out in a rash of red spots and then disappears. And then you don't, it doesn't make a fuss for 30 years. And then when you're in your 40s, it reappears again and causes these blisters to appear on your body, which is a disease that we call shingles. Epstein-Barr virus, you get the mononucleosis, the kissing disease. And then you get over it. You have kind of a fever and you feel sick for a few days and then you get over it. And then sometimes when you're middle aged, you get something called chronic fatigue syndrome, which they believe might be related to Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, and that's a reemergence. That's a that's a reemergence of the Epstein-Barr virus. Um, varicella zoster virus is a neurotrophic virus. So the varicella zoster virus was hiding in one of the peripheral nerves that comes out of your spinal cord. The Epstein-Barr virus infects B cells. It's, it, it, um, it's a, a leukotrophic virus. It, it infects white blood cells. And it stays inside certain white blood cells and hides for a few years until it bursts out and becomes uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. Okay, now a provirus. We mentioned the fact that some viruses integrate into the host cell chromosome. When they do that, we call it a provirus. Example, the human immunodeficiency virus. And a latent virus is a virus that just goes into hiding and doesn't make a fuss for many years, but it doesn't necessarily integrate. It doesn't necessarily have to be a provirus. Okay, some other terminology to become familiar with. An acute infection is a short-term infection. It's usually caused, if it's caused by a virus, it's caused by an aggressive lytic virus. And either your immune system destroys it 
in a short period of time, two, three weeks, or it, or you die from it if your immune system is unable to handle it. But either way, your body can't put up with it for, for very long, so it's an acute infection. Either your body kills it or it kills you, but it's over with after a short period of time. A persistent infection is where you have an infection over a long period of time. This is usually done by a temperate virus, by a lysogenic virus, because it doesn't make enough of a fuss to really provoke the immune system into coming out in force to destroy it. So you have a few viruses being produced every now and then. It's not really enough to trigger the immune system to do a good job to get rid of it. So the virus isn't very aggressive. That gives you a persistent infection with kind of recurring symptoms, small, low-grade symptoms, a cough, a persistent cough or something like that as a result of a persistent infection. Latent infections may or may not be acute. Right? So they may be aggressive. These viruses may be aggressive when they're active, but they go through long periods of time where they're not active. So varicella zoster virus and Epstein-Barr virus, particularly VSV, are, are perfect examples of that. And then the infection that you get from a virus may be localized. The HPV viruses cause warts, and so the wart is the center. You know, a wart is this ugly lump of flesh that's a different color than, the, than your skin. Uh, that those are actually caused by viruses. Believe it or not, those are caused by viruses. They don't just happen spontaneously. What happened was that you accidentally touched the skin of somebody that had a wart and it was shedding viruses and then one of those got transmitted to you. And so that's obviously an example of a localized infection. A systemic infection is like the influenza where it travels all over the body. It generally infects lung tissue, but once it gets into the lungs, it transfers into the blood, and then it gets transmitted around the blood all over the place, and so that generally infects your whole body, so that's a systemic infection. Okay, so to summarize viruses so far, we learned all about the shapes of capsids. We learned about naked versus envelope viruses. We learned about viral attachment proteins and receptor-mediated uh, endocytosis. We talked about the types of genomes and using the genome type to classify viruses according to the Baltimore classification scheme. And we learned about viral tropism versus viral host range. We learned about lytic versus lysogenic infections. We learned about acute versus persistent and even latent infections. Okay, now I'm just going to introduce you to another type of virus which is very rare. But, but we need to know about it anyway, which is called an oncovirus. The word onco, oncology, refers to the study of cancer. So the word onco means cancerous. And when you cause something to become cancerous, you say that you've transformed it. So when a cell becomes cancerous, you say that the cell was transformed. Right? So there are some viruses that do cause cancer. So I mentioned the fact earlier that when a virus, many viruses integrate into the human chromosome, if it happens to integrate at a random spot, if it happens to integrate into a random place that's near a, a gene that controls cell division, and that gene is normally turned off, but the strong promoters and enhancers that that virus brings with it causes that gene to be turned on, it will cause cancer. However, that's quite rare because, as I said before, only about 5% of the human genome codes for proteins, right? So only about 5% of the human genome is actually genes. And then of that 5%, probably only 10% of that is coding for genes that control the cell cycle, right? So the odds of a virus integrating right next to a gene that controls the cell cycle, the odds of that happening are very, very small. And so the odds of a regular of regular virus that integrates into the host genome causing cancer are very small because, you know, the odds of, you know, the, the odds of hitting the right gene are very very small. No doubt that's the cause of cancer once in a while. So sometimes that that is the cause of cancer, but usually not. So most of the time those types of viruses will not cause cancer. But there are some viruses that actually cause cancer 100% of the time and they work in a slightly different way, uh, a variation of what we've already talked about, and I'll, I'll, I will explain how that happens. Okay, so first, some terminology. 
Gene regulation refers to turning genes on and off when they should be turned on and off. Right? Transformation is the word we use to describe when a cell becomes cancerous. Basically, it, it starts dividing, even though it hasn't been told to divide. It has not been told to divide, but it just starts dividing and it doesn't stop. Okay, a proto-oncogene. An oncogene is basically a cancer gene, and proto means it's a cancer gene that hasn't been activated. Okay, do we have genes that, that are there to cause cancer? No. Proto-oncogene is a functional definition. If you're an oncologist, if you're a doctor that, call, that studies cancer, you call cell division genes proto-oncogenes because if you turn one of these genes on when it's not supposed to be turned on, you'll cause cancer. Right? If you're a regular geneticist, you don't call them proto-oncogenes, you call them genes that encode cell division proteins, cell genes that encode proteins that, that cause the cell to divide. Right? So this is a functional definition. Um, proto-oncogene is, is a fancy name for a gene that controls, a gene that codes for a protein that controls cell division. Those genes are normally turned off. If something happens to one of those genes, it gets mutated so that it's constantly turned on, or if, if a virus integrates next to it so that it gets turned on, then it becomes an oncogene, right? So we rename it an oncogene if that happens. All right, now a tumor suppressor gene. Okay, so you know that if you remember your biology 110, or if you've taken, better yet, if you've taken biology 234 genetics, you'll know that, that Every gene has a promoter, and every gene has some enhancers. The promoter is where the RNA polymerase complex will assemble and then transcribe the gene. The enhancers are DNA sequences that are located around the promoter that encourage the DNA polymerase, uh, the RNA polymerase complex to form and transcribe the gene. So promoters make it more likely that a gene will be transcribed. There are other pieces of DNA, there are other DNA sequences that are located near a gene that are, that are referred to as suppressor, gene, uh, uh, suppressor elements, rather, and there are proteins that stick to the, to the suppressors that discourage the gene from being transcribed. They make it less likely that the gene will be transcribed. Right? So, if enhancers bind, if proteins bind to enhancers and those proteins cause the gene to be transcribed more often, the flip side of that coin, the converse side of that coin, is that you also have pieces of DNA that are called suppressors that other proteins that are referred to as repressor proteins bind to those suppressors and prevent the gene from being transcribed. Okay, so there are actually two ways that you can convert a proto-oncogene into an oncogene. There are two ways that you can transform a cell from being a regular cell into a cancerous cell. One is you can, you can mutate the promoter so that of, a, of a gene so that the repressors can't stick to it and keep it turned off, right? So the gene is turned on because you remove the ability of the repressor genes to stop it from transcribing. On the other hand, you could bring, you, you, you could um, you could mutate the repressor genes, the repre you could mutate the repressor elements so that the repressor proteins can't stick to the gene and keep it turned off. Right. Okay, so, or you could, you know, you could stick in a, a, viral, a, a viral enhancer close to the promoter, which makes it more likely for that gene to be turned on. Right. Okay, so let me ask you this. If, if you have, you remember from first year, First, uh, you know, biology 110 or biology 234, you remember that there are two types of gene mutations. Mu gene mutations can be either dominant or recessive. Basically, what happens is that if you have to mutate, uh, if you have to mutate both copies of a gene, humans are diploid. We have two copies of each gene. If you have to mutate both copies of the gene in order to see the mutant phenotype, we say that that is a recessive. That gene is a recessive mutation. Right, so you have to have two copies of the mutant allele for eye color in order to have blue eyes.
right? So if you have one copy of the functional brown allele that makes brown pigment for the iris, and then you have a dysfunctional mutant version that would leave the iris its normal blue color, if you have one of each, you've got brown eyes. If you have two of the mutant alleles, you've got blue eyes, right? So that's a recessive mutation. On the other hand, if you only have to mutate one copy of the one of the two copies of a gene in order to see the mutant phenotype, we call that a dominant mutation. Right, so, do you think that a virus inserting itself next to a cell control gene and converting it into a proto-oncogene would it cause cancer as a dominant mutation or a recessive mutation? Okay, you can think about that, and then I'll tell you the answer. The answer is that that would be a dominant mutation. So you only have to mutate one of the two cell division genes in order to get that to happen, right? So only one of them has to be misregulated, turned on when it's supposed to be turned off in order for you to get cancer. Okay, now what about tumor suppressor genes? So here, tumor suppressor genes are where you have repressor proteins that stick to the area around a promoter to prevent it from being transcribed. Those repressor proteins, you've got two copies of the gene. Would you have to mutate one of them or both of them to cause cancer? And the answer is you'd have to mutate both of them. Right? So in order to cause cancer by mutating what are called tumor suppressor genes. So a tumor suppressor gene is just a gene that encodes a protein that is a repressor for a cell division protein, right? So the, the, the proteins that are encoded by the tumor suppressor gene are keeping, they code for proteins that keep the cell division genes turned off. And there are quite a few of them and they, and they stick to whichever gene that they work on. They each work on a different gene, cell division gene. Right, but if you want to, so if you have these proteins, just imagine you've got all these proteins. There's a gene that codes for, pro, there are two copies of the gene. There's a gene that codes for these proteins that stick to the promoter of a cell division gene. If you mutate one of them, you still have the other one functional, functional, and the other one is still producing the protein that sticks to the promoter and keeps that gene turned off. So if you want to cause cancer by mutating tumor suppressor genes, you have to mutate them both, right? So mutating a gene by sticking a viral protein near the promoter and causing it to be turned on when it's supposed to be turned off is a, is a dominant cancerous mutation. You only have to do that to one of the two copies of a cell division gene in order to get cancer. On the other hand, you have tumor suppressor genes that you need to mutate both copies in order to cause cancer because if you mutate one of the two copies of that gene, if you mutate one of the two alleles, you've still got another one that's producing that protein which is keeping that gene turned off. Right? So that's the difference. That is what a proto-oncogene is and a tumor suppressor gene is. I sometimes ask you to explain the difference on final exams or on midterm exams, but by the time you hear this for this course, it's already the midterm has already passed, so you might think about ways to explain that on the final exam. All right, so that's the difference between a proto-oncogene and a tumor suppressor gene. And so sometimes regular proto-oncogenes are converted into oncogenes because a virus integrates nearby it. It's rare, but it does happen. Okay, the word ectopic expression, the word expression means that a gene is turned on. Right? The word ectopic means at the wrong time or in the wrong place. Right? So ectopic expression of a proto-oncogene means that a, vi a virus that had a strong promoter inserted itself near a proto-oncogene and turned it into an oncogene. So that is a cause of cancer. It's rare, but it does happen. But it doesn't happen every time you get infected by a virus that integrates into the host cell chromosome. So as we've heard, there are some viruses, there are many viruses that just go and go to the nucleus and they integrate themselves into the into one of the chromosomes at a random spot. But that doesn't cause cancer every time because the the you know there are only a few can there are only a few uh, proto oncogenes in the human genome and the odds of this virus landing next to one of them is practically zero so it's rare to cause cancer that way 
Okay, so theoretically, any virus that integrates into the host cell genome could potentially cause cancer, but it's rare. Okay, now we have to worry about what happens. There are some virus, many viruses that insert themselves into random places, right? They jump into the genome, they jump into our chromosome at a random spot, but what they also do occasionally is they come back out, and that is called excision. Excision. So when a virus, when a provirus inserts itself into your chromosome, that's one thing. Occasionally it will pop back out, it'll jump back out, and that's called excision. Now, if it jumps out exactly as it came in and it doesn't tear out, accidentally tear away part of the host cell chromosome, that's called a precise excision. But if it accidentally tears out part of the host cell chromosome and takes it with it, that's called an imprecise excision. Okay, now let's imagine that the worst possible thing could happen. Everything that could possibly go wrong goes wrong. So what happens is that you have a virus that integrates into the host cell chromosome. It integrates right next to a proto-oncogene and converts it into an oncogene. Okay, you're in trouble because that's causing cancer. Now suppose that, that a virus does that and it does an imprecise excision. It tears itself back out and it gets into a capsid. And when it tears itself back out, it takes the oncogene with it. And then if that virus is infective, it travels. Everyone that it infects is guaranteed to get cancer. Right, so that's called an oncovirus uh, or an oncogenic virus. And they are very rare. Luckily, at the moment, there are no viruses like that that infect humans, but there is one that infects chickens, and it's called Rouse sarcoma virus. Rouse sarcoma virus is an oncogenic virus that always causes cancer in chickens if it gets into a chicken farm and spread around, for instance. Okay, so if the virus inserted itself into a, pronco, into a proto-oncogene and caused cancer, and then it does a, an imprecise excision and actually accidentally takes the oncogene out with it, it will definitely cause cancer wherever it goes. Right? And those are called oncoviruses. An example, RSV, RSV, Rouse sarcoma virus, which is a chicken virus, which can cause, guaranteed to cause cancer in chickens. Thank goodness. It does not infect humans. If it ever changes into a broad host range, virus will be in trouble, right? So the, it, it, it pays to do research on viruses and, and ways to, uh, to, to defeat viruses and prevent viruses and do research on vaccines because someday things like that may happen. All right, so oncogenic viruses. Pro, a provirus inserts itself into a proto-oncogene, converts it into an oncogene due to ectopic gene expression. And then if it does an imprecise excision, it takes, the onco, it takes the oncogene with it wherever it goes, and you've got an oncovirus. It's a guaranteed way to catch cancer. It's rare but possible. At the moment, the only example of, of, of the only common example of this is the Rouse sarcoma virus, which infects chickens. All right, now let's change gears. Let's change our topic for a little bit and discuss some examples of virology lab techniques. So how do we grow viruses in, in culture when they won't exist by themselves? They have, to be, they have to be inside a living cell. And secondly, how do we determine the number of viruses that somebody has in their blood? And that is, that is a technique called determining the viral titer. And uh, we have to use something called a plaque assay to do that. So we'll learn about these two things together. Okay, first, how do we culture viruses in the lab? How do we grow a culture of viruses in the lab? Uh, for example, we're growing up a bunch of viruses because we want to study them, or we're growing up a bunch of viruses because we want to make a vaccine. Uh, basically, that means growing up a bunch of these viruses and then killing them and then injecting them into somebody when they're dead. Okay, so viruses have to live in living cells. There are two ways to do. There are two ways to grow them. There are actually several ways to grow them, but I'm only going to list two ways. For example, okay, so first of all, if we're talking about the flu virus that has a broad host range, 
it infects humans. You want to grow up a bunch of these viruses in order to make a vaccine so you can make your yearly flu, virus, uh, flu vaccine. You grow them in chicken eggs. You propagate them in fertilized chicken eggs. Right? So that, that is usually the way that they grow many of the seasonal influenza virus vaccines. Right? So they have fertilized chicken eggs. In some cases, if the virus doesn't have a broad host range and it's unable to live in birds as well as humans, then you have to grow them in cultured cells, what's something that's called tissue culture. Okay, so we just I just mentioned the fact that when you say something is transformed, that means it becomes cancerous. Okay, so if you have a virus, let's say, for example, you have a virus that is a hepatotrophic virus, like the hepatitis A virus, right? You have to grow it in liver cells. Okay, a liver tumor is where you have transformed cells in the liver. It just so happens that when you transform cells, they become cancerous. They continue to divide uncontrollably. <clears throat> and you can usually, uh, you can grow cells like that in a flask, in a bottle. And so that's called a tissue culture, right? So if, you're, if you have a bottle that's filled with liver cells, that's an example of tissue culturing. Where did you get the liver cells to grow in that bottle? You derived them from a human liver cancer, for instance, from a tumor that some doctor took out of somebody's liver to cure them of liver cancer. So you can, and now the interesting thing is that cancerous liver cells retain many of the properties of regular liver cells, including a lot of the receptors on the surface, which means that if you're trying to grow hepatotrophic viruses, you can grow them inside transformed liver cells. You can grow them inside cancerous liver cells. The same thing is true for epithelial, you know, uh, cells that grow epithelial cell, epitheliotropic cells that grow in skin cells. You just get a cancerous tumor from a skin cancer, and then you convert that into what's known as a secondary cell line, and you grow them in culture, and then you grow the viruses inside the skin cells. So uh, there is a you know, uh, there there are transformed cell lines that were originally derived from human cancer cells that are available to grow every type of virus, every type of tropic virus in those cells, right? So that is called culture, tissue culturing when you grow human cells or animal cells in a bottle called a flask, a plastic flask. That's called tissue culturing, and the cells are referred to as cultured cells. So it's fairly common in the in the virology lab to be growing viruses in a in in uh, transformed cell lines. Okay, so as I said, influenza infects birds and humans. It has a broad host range. So generally, a lot of the time when they're making vaccines uh, against the 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 seasonal flu. They grow up a whole bunch of those influenza viruses in, chick in fertilized chicken eggs. So you have these laboratories that are busy. They, they inject the virus into one fertilized chicken egg, and then it, it reproduces in there. <clears throat> and then you take a you suck some of the you suck some of the fluid out of that egg, and you inject it into a bunch of other eggs. And then you have a whole lab full of eggs that are growing viruses for you. So the big pharmaceutical companies that make seasonal flu vaccines often have rooms and rooms full of fertilized chicken eggs that they're using to grow the virus. They grow it up and then they kill it and then they inject it into you as a vaccine. And that's why they, uh, that is why they get you to sign a form that, that asks you whether or not you're allergic to chicken eggs because they grew it and the, the, the vaccine that they give you sometimes contains a little bit of chicken egg uh, protein in there as well. Okay, so the flu vaccine is sometimes grown in, in fertilized chicken eggs. Okay, so if you take transformed cancerous cells, you can grow them in a plastic flask because they divide with an unlimited number of cell divisions. Um, if you took Biology 200, you know all about that. Or if you're going to take Biology 200, you'll learn all, all about in great detail about cultured cell lines. And uh, you grow them in an incubator that is mimics the conditions inside the human body or inside human blood, which is namely, 30, namely 37 degrees Celsius, 5% carbon dioxide, 95% humidity. <clears throat> 
So you get the cells generally from cancerous tumors. Uh, you get them from different parts of the body to match the viral tropism of the virus. One example of human cell lines that you should memorize, any bio, every biologist should know the name of these cell lines. They are called HeLa cells. They're called HeLa cells because they were originally derived from a poor, unfortunate woman named Henrietta Lacks. So that's where the he, H-E-L-A, came from, the initials in Henrietta Lacks's name. And they were extracted. She had cervical cancer. The surgeon extracted the cervical, the, the tumor from her cervix and then discovered that he could grow it in a bottle. Uh, unfortunately, she died anyway of cancer. Uh, but the, the, her cell line, cancerous tumor, lives on in thousands and thousands of laboratories all over the world. Okay, so here we have uh, flasks. These are uh, tissue culturing flasks. The red liquid in there is a medium that's growth medium that is there to feed the cells. It's filled with amino acids and vitamins and a, and a pH buffer. You generally work with these tissue culture flasks inside something called a laminar flow hood so they don't get infected. And then you grow the cells in a, you put the flasks in an incubator that's at 37 degrees, 5% carbon dioxide, 95% humidity. That this pan at the bottom here is filled with water to make sure that it's at 95% humidity. You can see all the flasks up here at the top. And this is poor Henrietta Lacks. Um, uh, it's interesting. Uh, I, some of you that are involved in the study of ethics might find this interesting, but uh, various companies sell HeLa cells to, to laboratories all over the world, and there are thousands and thousands of cell biology labs all over the world that are doing experiments with Helen Henrietta Lacks's cells. And her family and her estate never got a penny of that money. Uh, if, if, if every lab in the world that was using Henrietta Lacks's cells to do experiments had to pay one penny to her estate, to her family, they would be multimillionaires easily because the, her cells are being so widely used for experiments. But not just her cells, the cells of dozens of other people that had that had liver, liver cancers and esophageal cancers and skin cancers, their tumors were removed and turned into cell lines which are now being sold and bought and sold by laboratories and, and biotech companies and used to grow viruses and culture and so on. Uh, and as far as I know, none of the people have ever gotten any of the royalties for that. So ethics, let's ask ourselves, we need to have a debate about whether or not you know, scientific research that harvests cells from people, whether or not we're supposed to, we should be paying them for their uh, body tissues. You know, personally, I think we should. But anyway, that's an ethics issue, and that's not the actual topic of this course. All right, now let's go on and ask, how do you count the number of viruses that you have in a sample of fluid? So let's say that you have a sample of sputum, that's saliva, basically, spit. Or if you have a sample of urine that has viruses in it, or if you have a sample of blood that has viruses in it, how do you know how many viruses that you have? Well, you do something called a plaque assay, and then you find, you determine a number that's called the PFU per mil, and PFU stands for plaque forming units plaque forming units per mil, right? And when you do this, you have determined what's called the viral titer. The viral titer is expressed in plaque forming units per mil, right? So you should memorize this. I might ask you about this on the final, right? So you measure the, the amount of viruses in the bloodstream using a plaque assay and you determine the viral titer. The viral titer is recorded as the number of plaque forming units per mil. So what you do is you grow a layer of host cells for these viruses in, a, in the bottom of a Petri plate, and then you use something called an adherent cell line. Adherent means it sticks to the bottom of the plate, right? So there are some cells that will stick to the bottom of the plate and others that won't, so you have to use the appropriate type of cell, right? And then you take one mil of blood and you put it onto the plate, and then each cell that's infected will infect adjacent cells and it'll infect adjacent cells next to those cells next to those cells and if it's a lytic virus those those cells will burst and instead of seeing cells on the bottom of the 
Petri dish, you'll see little blank spots, little empty spots that are called plaques where the virus, and so the theory is that one virus infected a cell there, it burst and then infected the adjacent cells, which burst and then infected the adjacent cells, eventually giving rise to a bald spot on the bottom of the plate called a plaque. And then you simply count the number of plaques that you that you generated per mill, and then you then you count then you've got the viral titer, which is calculated as the number of plaque forming units per mill. So here we have a plate that has these spots on it are the plaques, and the 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 cell lines were grown on the bottom of the plate. And then we have plaques forming. And then if you count, if you had spread a mill of blood on that plate and you got this number of plaques, you could simply count up the number of bald spots, the number of plaques, and then that would give you the PFU per mil. All right, so that so does this technique work with lytic or lysogenic viruses? And the answer is it only works with lytic viruses. You can only do a plaque forming assay with lytic viruses. So if somebody's infected with lysogenic viruses, you have to do another way to measure the number of viruses per mil. Generally, you would not express it as plaque forming units per mil because it's not a lytic virus. Uh, you would usually measure it using PCR. So PCR is a method that you can use to count the number of viral genes that are present per milliliter of blood. So that would be another way to measure it. But you do need to be familiar with the plaque assay and the plaque forming unit per mil method of measuring the amount of viruses in blood. And as I said, this is with the caveat that you can only use this technique for lytic viruses. Okay, here's a question. What do you do if there are too many viruses to count the plaques, right? So Generally speaking, if you have a Petri plate and there are more than 300 plaques in it, we call that TNTC, too numerous to count. Too numerous to count. The same thing is true if you're trying to measure the number of bacteria in a mill of solution. You spread the bacteria onto a Petri plate and the number of bacterial colonies that you get will give you the CFU per mill. What do you think CFU per mill stands for? stands for colony forming units per mil, right? So both of these assays were derived, invented by microbiologists who were doing the same thing, sort of. And so CFU per mil, colony forming units per mil, is a way of counting the number of bacteria per mil. And then PFU per mil is the number of, uh, counting the number of, uh, sorry, viral plaques per, per mil. Right now, if you have a plate and you put a mill on there and then you counted the number of plates and there was more than 300, statistically, that's unreliable because the, the more plaques you have on a plate or the more colonies you have on a plate, the greater the odds that you had one vi that you had two viruses landing in the same place and making just one plaque but it, there should really be two plaques and there would have been two plaques if they were farther apart. So statistically, you cannot count more than 300 on a plate, right? So generally, if you're counting the number of colony forming units per mil because you're counting bacteria, if it's more than 300, you would write in your notebook that this particular plate has TNTC on it, too numerous to count. If you're doing a plaque assay and you put a mil onto a plate and then you see that there's more than 300 plaques, you can't use the result. You have to write into your notebook, you have to write TNTC, too numerous to count. Okay, so what do we do? Obviously, how about just taking the liquid that you did and diluting it and then trying again and diluting it. If you still have 300 or more on the plate, then you dilute it again and plate it again. And then you keep on doing dilutions until you have fewer than 300. Right, so generally, uh, you account for the fact that you'll probably have too numerous to count. You'll have too many to count several times. And what you do is you do a, a bunch of what are called serial dilutions before you even start. So you take your solution and you divide it in half, and then you divide it into quarters, and then you divide it into an eighth, and then sixteenth, and a thirty-second. And then you plate a mill of each of those, and then you look to see which plates have less than 300, and you just count those. Okay, so over here on the right, we have a plate that has two numerous to count plaques, and over on the left is what we want. Right, so what if, we, what if we plated one mil and we got this the first time out? We can't count that, so we have to go back and do a dilution. We'll dilute the, 
viruses one and two, you know, we, we had five mil of blood, we'll add five mil of water, that's a one and two dilution. And then we try again. And then suppose we still get more than 300, then we dilute it some more and try again. Okay, so what you generally do is you do a bunch of these dilutions before you even plate them so that you expect that some of them will have too many to count, but you expect that some of them will have enough that you can count. And so you do a serial dilution to account for this. Right? So you take your sample and before you put it on any plates, you make a series of dilutions. And then you take each of the, those dilutions and you put them onto plates. And then you look to see which plates have less than 300 and you just count those. And that is referred to as a serial dilution. And a serial dilution can be used if you're counting bacteria and CFUs per mil, or if you're counting viruses and PFUs per mil. Okay, so you do a series of one and two dilutions or one and five dilutions or one and 10 dilutions, it doesn't matter, as long as you do a few dilutions and you know what they are, right? So then you plate each of the dilutions onto a different plate. And then you take the plate or plates that has between 30 and 300, which is statistically accurate. So remember these two numbers. In order for the plate to be countable and statistically significant, it has to have between 30 and 300 plaques on it. Can't have less than 30, can't have more than 300. If we're talking about colonies, it can't have more than 300 colonies, can't have less than 30 colonies, right? So mem remember both of those numbers. So then you multiply by the dilution factor. So what do, what do I mean by that? I'll show you. Okay, so here we're doing a plaque assay, for instance. So we take the we take a mill of blood, right? And then we do a we do a one in ten dilution, or sorry, a one in a hundred. We're doing one in hundreds here. That's what the chart says, right? So we do a one in one hundred dilution, and we plate that. And there were so many viruses in there that the whole plate is just one big plaque. Right? But before we even plated, it, we, we did a 1 in 10 dilution of that one, and then we did a 1 in 10 dilution of that one, and then we did a 1 in 10 dilution, 1 in 10 dilution, 1 in 10 dilution, and then we plated them all at once. And then we put them in the incubator, and we came back the next day, and we inspected them, and we saw that all of these are just one big plaque. And, all of, and this one is still too numerous to count, so that's, these are all T and TC. But... And this one is too few, right? This one down here is too few. But this one here is just right. And what was the dilution factor? Okay, so we diluted 1 in 100, right? So the dilution factor is 10 to the minus 2. And then we took that and we diluted 1 in 10, so the dilution factor is 10 to the minus 3. And then we took 1 in 10 of that, so the dilution factor is 10 to the minus 4 and then 10 to the minus 5. So the dilution factor for the plate that we can count is 10 to the minus 6, right? So now how do you how do you figure out how many actual viruses are in there? Well, let's count this. I'm going to count right now. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, right? So we have 10 there, and we have a dilution factor of 10 to the minus 6, right? So then we simply invert that and multiply 10 times 10 to the plus 6, right? So 10 times 10 to the 6 would be uh, 10 million, right? So that means that the PFU would be 10 million PFU per mil. And we got that because we did a serial dilution before we did any plates. So we, d we d did several dilutions that we, you know, we kept track of the dilution factor. We plated them all, and then we came back the next day and we looked to see which plates we were able to count. And then we count them, and then we multiply by the dilution factors in order to get the actual PFU per mil. Right? So you can use this with either PFU per mil or CFU per mil, depending on whether you're counting lytic viruses or whether you're counting bacteria in a solution. So when we were talking about coliform counts earlier in the course, when we were talking about the, uh, the, the lecture on bacterial phyla, we mentioned the fact that coliform counts is where you, you use coliform counts uh, to count whether or not water is safe to drink or whether water is safe to fish in or whether water is safe to swim in. There are different numbers, right? So 200 
uh, CFU per mil, I believe, is the, or you take 100 mils and then you count 200 CFU in 200 mils. That's the acceptable level for fishing, but not drinking, for instance. So when you're doing a coliform count, you would do a CFU per mil count. Right. If you're doing virology, you do a PFU per mil count. And in both cases, you would probably do a serial dilution to avoid having to do the experiment several times if you ended up with too numerous to count the first time. So that is a serial dilution. Serial dilution is a very common thing you would have to do if you're a virologist. So you should memorize and learn how to learn and memorize how to do it. All right, so to summarize the viral techniques, how do we grow viruses? We can grow them in chicken eggs if they have a broad host range, which is what we often do with the influenza virus, or you can grow them in various types of cultured cells. And then the lab techniques, you can count lytic viruses by doing a plaque assay, and it's common practice to do a plaque assay or a colony forming unit assay by doing a serial dilution first. All right, let's change course finally yet again and talk about how vaccines work. All right, so we've mentioned the fact that vaccines uh, are preparing your immune system to kill the viruses before they have a chance to infect your cells. And this is the only effective defense that we really have against viruses. All right, so if you remember from Biology 120, uh, your immune system, you have phagocytes. They wander around and they eat viruses and bacteria that are, that are in your body. They then present the antigens on their own surface. They present the antigens to T helper cells that, that, and then they help the T helper cells recognize them as a foreign antigen. The T helper cell then goes and finds a B cell or a group of B cells that are capable of making antibodies that will attack that specific foreign protein. And when this whole process is referred to as a primary immune response, which takes about 10 days. Right? So from the time that a phagocyte eats a virus and presents it to a T helper cell, and the T helper cell then goes and finds a B cell and then that can make an antibody that will bind to that particular antigen and help kill the virus. And then tells that B cell to, to multiply, that's called clonal selection and clonal expansion, and then differentiate into a, a type of cell that's specifically made to produce antibodies, which is called a plasma cell. That's a fairly complicated process, but it takes about 10 days. And then you kill the virus. And then when the virus is gone, the immune system says, well, I'm gonna leave some, some memory cells around in case that virus ever dares to show itself around this neighborhood again. All right, so your immune system leaves behind memory cells that can go through this, that, that don't have to go through this whole process again. They're already ready for this virus. And so the second time your body sees the virus, you're ready for it and it kills, kills it immediately. And that's referred to as a secondary immune response. The secondary immune response doesn't take 10 days, it usually happens the same day, where these memory B cells come into action and they start producing millions and millions of antibodies that kill this virus or deactivate the virus before it has a chance to infect your cells. Right now, if you were infected with a live virus the first time, you'll get sick and you'll be very sick for 10 days until your body can mount the primary immune response and kill the virus. But what if we injected you with a dead virus? Does the, does the immune system react to the dead virus the same way it would to a live virus? And the answer is yes. And so the, the immune system prepares, you inject a dead virus into a person, the virus doesn't make you sick because it's, it's non-viable, but your immune system still mounts the primary immune response and then after it's over, it leaves behind the memory cells and then your body is ready to immediately destroy that virus the next time it sees it. Presumably the next time you see it, it'll be live. Okay, so a vaccine is where you kill a virus, you inject it into somebody, the dead virus can't hurt you, but your body still mounts a primary immune response and then leaves memory cells behind. 
Uh, sometimes those, depending on which type of virus we're talking about and which type of foreign antigen and which type of memory cells are left behind, your immunity may last longer for some viruses than others, right? So there, that's why there are some viruses that you get vaccinated to, and then you have to go back for what's called a booster shot a few years later. And that's because the immunity uh, that's left by the memory cells doesn't last forever. For certain types of antigens that are on certain types of viruses, it may last for most of your life, and for others it only lasts for a few years. Okay, so here we have plasma cell producing antibodies that coat a, a bacteria that's invading the body. Same thing would apply for viruses, and coating uh, coating uh, the invader with antibodies is something called opsonization, which makes it easier for your immune system to kill it. Okay, now just showing you what the primary versus secondary immune response looks like. So if we inject somebody with a virus at day one, right, so we expose them to a virus that has antigen on the surface, an antigen which we're going to call antigen A, right? So virus A has antigen A on the surface. We inject somebody with that virus and then we count the amount of antibodies, anti-A antibodies that are present in their blood every day after that. You see that the amount of antibodies that will kill antigen A increases steadily over a two week period, eventually peaking at around two weeks, and then the, your immune system has killed the virus, it doesn't, the virus isn't there anymore, and so the production of antibodies drops off. Okay, then we inject the same person with the same virus, and the second time, this is the secondary response now, bang, look at how fast the antibodies in the, in the blood increased basically on the same day. And notice that the scale on the y-axis of this graph is not linear. So over here, during the primary immune response, it took us two weeks to get a primary immune response, and we only got 100 antibodies per mil. Over here, we've got 10,000 antibodies per mil. Right, so the, response, the, the secondary immune response was immediate. It didn't take 14 days. It happened basically the same day. And it produced a thousand times more antibodies than the primary ant uh, response did. Right? So the secondary immune response is much stronger and much more immediate. Okay, now this, is, this bit over here is what they call an experimental control. It's a good example of an experimental control. And what they did was they inject somebody with a different virus that has a different antigen on it on another day so that somebody can't say, well, how do you know that, you know, that, that will any old virus after day, you know, you're trying to make the point that this is the secondary response to the original virus, and some, some critic might say to you, well, how do you know that uh, your body's not going to respond that way to any old antigen the second time that you inject any antigen, you'll get that response, and this is the answer. If you inject a different virus with a different antigen, you get the primary immune response, which is weak and takes 14 days. No, it's the, 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 the immune response that you get to these antigens on the surface of these viruses is very specific to that specific antigen and that specific virus. Okay, there's some problems with this, and that is that your body has a, a pre-existing repertoire, a pre-existing library, if you will, of only about 2.5 million different types of B cells that are capable of responding to 2.5 million, approximately two or three million different types of foreign proteins. So what that means is that we, we, while we, have, we may have a B cell in our library that can respond to lots of different viruses, we don't have a B cell that can match every possible invader. We don't have a B cell that can produce antibodies that can respond to every possible antigen, foreign antigen that invades our body. And that's what determines whether, whether or not we had a successful virus versus an unsuccessful virus. So, uh, or a successful vaccine versus an unsuccessful vaccine. So there are some vaccines that we've been very lucky and we've, we've succeeded in making a, a vaccine that kills the virus. The polio virus was a success story like that. So obviously humans, as a, a, the human race in general, each of us has, antibody has B cells that can make antibodies that can kill the polio virus.
The herpes virus, on the other hand, we've never been able to make a vaccine to it, which means that as uh, the human race as a whole does not have B cells that can make antibodies that can kill the herpes virus. Right. So that's why we have some vaccines that have been successful, and there are some viruses that we've never been able to make a vaccine to. Example, we've never been able to make a vaccine to the AIDS virus, and that's, it's not because we're not making the right kind of vaccine. It's because our immune system doesn't have a B cell that can deal with it. All right, let me just give you some historical anecdotes about the first uh, big success story for vaccines namely the polio virus and the polio vaccine. Okay, a little bit of history. I'm not going to ask you about this history, but those of you that are studying history, do you know who these three guys are? Right, you might <clears throat> you might recognize the guy on the left as being Winston Churchill. Guy on the right is Joseph Stalin, right? So the leaders of the leaders of Britain and the Soviet Union, and who's the guy in the middle? If you don't know your American history, this is Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was one of the one of the great famous presidents in American history. Uh, Roosevelt was president of the United States during the Great Depression, and he brought in something called the New Deal. You might might have heard about politicians in the United States talking about the Green New Deal. That's that term is inspired by Roosevelt's original New Deal, which was basically uh, spreading. Uh, taxing wealthy people during a depression and then spreading the money around to public works projects, which got the economy going again. And then in, in uh, World War II broke out, and so then Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president of the United States during World War II. So he was one of uh, the United States' most famous presidents. All right, now this is Franklin Delano Roosevelt on the campaign trail back in the days when they used to travel around to different cities on trains. And so he would, his train would stop in each city and then he'd get, he'd come out of the, you know, he, he'd be in the, in the, in the last car on the train. He'd come out onto the balcony of the train and give a speech and then they'd go to the next town. And you can see there right beside him, this guy is his son, James, James Roosevelt. And notice that they've locked arms. Can you guess what James is doing for his father here? It's not well known, but James is actually holding uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt up because Franklin Roosevelt was paralyzed from the waist down due to polio, and uh, so he he was rarely fil he was rarely photographed in his wheelchair. Uh, I think in those days, very not 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 everyone knew that he had polio. Uh, he was capable of standing up if he put his legs into braces, um, and uh, so he could stand up. And then if he was held up, if they were having a a line of people coming by to shake his hands, his son would stand there and hold him up. Um, and and uh, but he had polio, and many people around the world had polio, and. Uh, uh, polio, in its worst in its worst case, would paralyze you from the neck down. In the case of Roosevelt, he was lucky because he was only paralyzed from the waist down. And there are many other people who were only paralyzed, you know, different, slightly paralyzed here and there. But there was a range of disabilities that were caused by polio. But in the worst case scenario, it would paralyze you completely, which is quite terrible. Example. This is this little girl is living inside something called an iron lung, which is what they used to help you breathe before they invented ventilators. These days, people who are paralyzed from the neck down, they're ventilator dependent quadriplegic, means that you have a you have a hole drilled in your throat, and then they put in a tube that leads directly to your lungs, and it's attached to a machine that helps you to breathe. They didn't do that back in those days, back in the 20s and 1920s and 1930s, because if you cut a hole, if you did a tracheotomy in somebody's throat, it would probably get infected, and they hadn't yet invented antibiotics to get rid of the infection. So these days, they're less reluctant to cut holes in people's throat, in tr people's trachea, and put a ventilator hose into their throat. And so in the tw 1920s and 1930s and up into the 40s, if somebody was a ventilator, if somebody was paralyzed from the neck down and their diaphragm didn't work so they couldn't breathe on their own, they had to spend their life or, or a big part of their life in one of these machines, which was called an iron lung. 
And so this iron lung, what it does is it raises and lowers the pressure inside the drum, inside this metal drum, which brings air in and out of your lungs. This is, a, this is an entire hospital ward filled with people who are living in these iron lungs. It's a terrible tragedy to be paralyzed from the neck down like that and to not be able to move around. You spend your life in one of these metal containers because you can't breathe otherwise. So polio was a terrible disease. It was a terrible scourge on the human race. So in 1938, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who I just showed you, the President of the United States, started up a charity called the March of Dimes, where people would go around collecting, asking people for a dime here and a dime there. You would donate a dime, and all of those dimes would come together and be, used, be spent on research on ways to prevent polio. And eventually, in 1955, a scientist named Jonas Salk invented a way to grow up the polio virus in a monkey cell line, a, a cell line that, that he derived originally from monkeys. So he grew up all these viruses inside monkey cells and then killed them with, uh, by heating them up. And then you inject them into people and you have the first polio vaccine, which is the Salk vaccine. Uh, Jonas Salk became very famous for that. He won the Nobel Prize, I believe. And uh, there's institutions named after Jonas Salk all over the place. A friend of mine uh, did a postdoctoral fellowship at a, at a very famous research institution in California called the Salk Institute. Uh, so, th so that was the first big success story. Polio has now been eradicated from the world thanks to the success of the Salk vaccine. Okay, the Salk vaccine was injected. So the, the, you grow the virus up in monkey cells and then you kill it by heating it and then you inject the heat killed vaccine. You also mix it with a chemical called formalin to cross-link the proteins. And then you, so you inject somebody with the dead virus and they are then immune to polio. Okay, then in 1960, another scientist named Albert Sabin invented an, what's known as the oral vaccine. And he used something called a live attenuated virus. So what he did was he took the polio, vac the polio virus and he mutated it genetically. Uh, those of you that have taken biology 234 will know that there are various artificial methods that you can use to mutate genes artificially. So he mutated the polio vaccine so that it no longer caused polio, but it would still generate the primary immune response to the polio virus. Right, so that was that was that the interesting thing about that was that it was a live polio virus, but it was considered to be harmless. Right, so you would uh, normally you get polio through the oral fecal route. So you drink contaminated water. People would often get polio by swimming in dirty water that had a little bit of sewage contamination in it. And so you could take this vaccine orally because it's a, it's a polio virus and a, a polio virus is contracted by the oral fecal route. So you take the polio virus orally. Okay, so this was a big deal when they invented an oral vaccine, which was made from what's known as a live attenuated virus. Attenuated means altered, right? It means altered in some way. And so the, the Sabine mutated the genes that, uh, that uh, uh, caused the polio virus to cause polio, but kept the genes on the polio virus capsid. Right, so the way you take the oral vaccine is you put a drop of it on a sugar cube, right, and then you uh, just feed it to a child. Right, so there are two ways that you can get the polio vaccine. Probably most of you that are listening to this have had the polio vaccine. If you're very young, you might not have because polio might have been eradicated uh, by the time you were old enough, and so they didn't think it was necessary to vaccinate you. But for a long time, the, the World Health Organization helped distribute these oral vaccines around the world um, because in order to, uh, to er help eradicate polio virus. Okay, so uh, various places around the world, the world, he world Health Organization was either injecting people with the Salk vaccine or giving people a drop of the Sabine vaccine to immunize them against polio. Now, what's, why would it make a difference? Well, the, the, the one that you inject is more expensive because you have to buy the needles, right? So you have to buy uh, you have to buy a whole bunch of hypodermic needles to inject the, the Salk vaccine. Uh, 
but if you just if you're just dropping it down somebody's throat you don't need all the needles so generally the oral vaccine is much much cheaper and so if you're from a country that didn't have a lot of money to spend on needles you probably got the oral vaccine okay this shows the timeline of when the oral vaccine versus the injection vaccine was used so you see that between 1955 and 1968 the Salk vaccine that you inject was used mostly, and then the oral vaccine was invented, and it was used extensively. I got the polio vaccine in 1967, right here, right? Which one do you think I got? I remember I was in the first grade, and uh, uh, the, the teachers at school sent all of the first grade students home with a note from the school it was a permission slip from that our parents were supposed to sign to give the school permission to give us the polio vaccine. And I, I had heard that vaccines were a needle you get injected with, and so I, was, I hated needles. I don't mind them so much now, but I, I hated them then. So I was terrified of this needle, and I remember that we all, my, you know, I told my parents, don't sign that piece of paper. I don't want to get, a, I don't want to get poked with a needle. And they said, oh, you have to get vaccinated against polio. That's a terrible disease. Believe me, the needle is not as bad as the disease. And so so I, I begged them to not sign the permission slip, but they said, no, you've got to get vaccinated. So I remember the next day I was standing in the cafeteria, which is where the nurse was, and there was a nurse at a table in the front of the cafeteria, and all the children in first grade were lined up one by one to get to the nurse. And I was my best friend, Dan, Danny and I were standing in line and we were saying, how much do you think it's going to hurt? How big do you think the needle is? How much do you think it's going to hurt? And we were, the, the closer we got to the front of the line, the more scared we were. We finally got to the front of the line. I got to the front of the line and the nurse handed me a, a little tiny paper cup with a sugar cube in it with an orange dot in the middle. And she said, just eat that. And I said, there's no needle? And she said, no, there's no needle. So I got the Sabine vaccine in 1967. Now you notice that the Salk vaccine stopped being used in about 1968. The reason for that was because when you grow up, uh, there was a little problem with this, which is that when you grow up, when you grow the, the vac when you grow the virus in these cells and then you kill it by heating it and mixing it with formaldehyde, can you guarantee that you've killed 100% of the polio virus? And the answer is no, you can't. And so what happened was when they were doing this, most people got immunized and protected from polio virus, but one or two people actually caught polio from the vaccination because 100% of the viruses were not killed. And so immediately the company that was making the vaccine got sued and the company stopped producing it, right? So that's why the companies that were making the Salk vaccine, they stopped producing it in 1968. Okay, that, that, then we, that leaves us with the live attenuated vaccine, the Sabine vaccine, in between these two periods. Right? And why do you think the live one stopped? The live attenuated one stopped because, as you know, those of you that have taken Biology 234 or remember from Biology 110, if you mutate a gene, it's possible that it can sustain what's known as a back mutation. Occasionally, a gene goes from the wild type gene to a mutant form, that's rare. And it's very rare that the gene will actually change back, but it does happen, right? So that, at that point, people started getting, a uh, few people got polio from the live attenuated vaccine as well due to back mutations. And so then they started using the injectable form again. So the, at the end, they decided that the injectable form was, was less dangerous than the live attenuated form. Why did they continue using the live attenuated form in some parts of the world? Both the injectable form and the live attenuated form were causing a few people to get polio, while at the same time protecting the vast majority of people. And as a society in those days, we decided that that was okay. It was, it was an acceptable risk. Uh, 
for one or two people to get polio if the whole world was protected from getting polio. That was a decision that, that the world made in those days. These days, people tend to be more iconoclastic and more rebellious and, and demand their rights and their free, freedoms and make noise about being exploited and treated as guinea pigs. <clears throat> and so I'm not sure we could do that now. But in those days, that is what was done. Uh, and they were using the injectable form, which is less slightly, which is less dangerous than the live attenuated form. In fact, now we have much better techniques so that we, you actually, not only do you mutate the gene in the polio virus, but you remove the gene so that it can't possibly change back. And so it, it is perfectly safe to do now. But between 1955 and about 19, 1985, there was some doubts about people catching polio from the vaccine. Um, okay, so uh, that now, in, in fact, what happened was all the company, because people were getting sued from getting, uh, occasionally getting uh, adverse effects from vaccines, the companies that, the pharmaceutical companies said, well, to heck with this, we're not going to, if people are going to sue us, we're not going to manufacture vaccines anymore. And then the United States and other countries decided that they needed the vaccines. And so what they did was they passed a law that says you can't sue the company directly if you get sick from a vaccine. But every company that makes vaccines has to pay a tax into a common, a common pool of money, a common pot of money. And we will set up a specialized court called the vaccine court, which awards damages from that pot of money to people who've been damaged by vaccines. Okay, now, uh, so that is how it's done today. In order, in order to convince the pharmaceutical companies to manufacture vaccines, which we need, they had to set up the vaccine court and pass a law which forbids you from suing the pharmaceutical company if you get an adverse effect from the vaccine. Instead, you, you go to the vaccine court and the, and the vaccine court decides if you've been damaged by the vaccine, then you get some money from this tax pool that they've generated. Right? So that's how the system works. Now, people who are against vaccinations, we call them anti-vaxxers, they point to the fact that the uh, vaccine court is indeed awarding people damages for being who, people who've been damaged by vaccines. But those people who've been damaged by vaccines have not been damaged by the vaccine itself. 99% of the time, they've been damaged by the vaccine being contaminated with something, right? So if you have, if you buy a bottle of aspirin from the drugstore, and then you take the aspirin and you get sick because the aspirin was contaminated with Staphylococcus aureus, that's not a problem with the aspirin, it's a problem with contamination of the aspirin. The aspirin itself is not dangerous, the aspirin itself is not, did not make you sick, it was a contamination that made you sick. So the vaccine court does in fact uh, award people money for being damaged by vaccines, but 99% of the time, 99.99% of the time, it's the fact that the, the needle was dirty and so you had an adverse reaction, you got infected by the injection, or you got infected because the vaccine was contaminated with fungus, uh, not because the vaccine itself was dangerous, right? But nevertheless, the, the anti-vaxxer people who are against vaccinations are constantly pointing out the fact that the vaccine courts have been giving people money, so therefore vaccines must be dangerous. No, vaccines are not dangerous. Contaminated vaccines are dangerous, but contaminated anything is dangerous. Okay, so that's, that was just my little explanation of the vaccine court. Okay, so there are several different types of vaccines that are available for different purposes. A killed vaccine is where you grow the virus up in animal cells or something like that, and then you kill them by heating them or, or mixing them with formaldehyde or a related chemical called formalin, and that's what you inject. Or you can have a live attenuated vaccine, which is where you genetically mutate the virus so that it's harmless, hopefully. A recombinant vaccine is where you clone the viral protein into something like E. coli, and then you purify the viral proteins. You get the E. coli, uh, a, you get a harmless bacteria basically to produce the, basically you just, you produce the protein by itself, and then you inject the viral proteins as the vaccine instead of injecting the whole, uh, the whole virus. Uh, 
that's a much better way to do it, except that sometimes when you've made the proteins by themselves, they don't generate the same immune response as you get if the, vac if the protein is on the surface of a virus, right? So sometimes recombinant vaccines don't work as well as killed or live attenuated vaccines. And um, it's also much more expensive to, it's a little bit more expensive to do that. Okay, third, a passive vaccine. This is interesting. A passive vaccine is where you inject an animal, like a horse, with the virus, and then you let the horse's body make the antibodies, and then you take the antibodies out of the horse's blood and you inject them into a person, usually a person who's already got the viral infection. So the antibodies that the horse produced will kill the virus for you. Your immune, your, uh, your B cells are not required to make the antibody. And so this is usually done if you need the antibodies in a hurry. Okay, now example, you know that we now have the COVID-19 virus. You know that a lot of people have gotten the virus and survived it. And therefore, their immune system, their blood contains antibodies that will kill the COVID-19 virus. And so the serum from people who have recovered from COVID-19 is actually being used to cure people who've caught COVID-19 and have not gotten over it yet. Right? So that's called, those are called passive vaccines. And so there are many examples of passive vaccines, but basically what you do is you either uh, your, the virus that you're infected with is not killed by your antibodies. They're killed by antibodies that somebody else made or that an animal made. And, the, and so they just purify the antibodies and inject them into you, but you didn't make them. Therefore, it's a passive rather than an active vaccine. And finally, people are experimenting these days with taking viral proteins and then putting them, cloning them into lactobacillus, which is a harmless bacteria, and then injecting that into people and then uh, so that it, it's, you have viral proteins on the surface of a harmless bacteria, which elicits the proper immune response. Okay, if you go to the CDC website, you can see all of these diseases which can be prevented by vaccines, right? There are dozens of them, right? So all of these diseases can be prevented by vaccination, right? So that includes anthrax, cervical cancer in the form of HPV, diphtheria, hepatitis A and B, influenza, uh, H1N1, Lyme disease, measles, tetanus, pneumococcal pneumonia, poliomyelitis, that's polio, pertussis, yellow fever, varicella zoster, and so on. All of these things can be prevented by vaccination. There are some viral infections that we've never been able to make a vaccine against, and it's because we don't have the right B cell. The human race as a whole does not have the right B cell for that. So hepatitis C, Epstein-Barr virus, human herpes virus, and the AIDS virus are examples of failures. Okay, now there is some concern. There's a movement, a popular movement around the world of people who say that vaccines are bad for you, uh, but I'm here to say that they're not. I've never seen any reason to believe they are. And uh, some people say that vaccines are bad for you, or if vaccines themselves are not bad for you, it's bad for you to have too many vaccines at once at a single time. Well, there is something, uh, if you join the army or if you get conscripted into the army like a lot of people are in the world, uh, soldiers can be sent all over the world to fight in various places where certain diseases are endemic, and those diseases can be prevented by injections, by vaccinations, but they don't really have time to do it when they get called up and sent to these places. You have to be ready to, if you're a soldier, you have to be ready to move to these various places all over the world at a moment's notice. And so you have to be, you have to be immune to these diseases beforehand. So in most places in the world where they have armies, when you join the army or you get drafted into the army, they on your first day almost, or in the first week that you're in the army, they give you something called a military series vaccination, which in the Canadian army and the US army includes being vaccinated for all of these diseases within a week or so of joining the army. So if soldiers get vaccinated with all these things and they don't appear to be getting sick as a result of it, 
it's unlikely that babies will get sick from having multiple vaccines as well, because one of the things that uh, people who are opposed to vaccines, one of the things they think is bad is that, you know, there's some that think that it's bad to give children vaccines at all. And there are others that think it's bad to give them vaccines several at a time, right? So they'd prefer it if you space out the vaccines. Um, but uh, the military service vaccination indicates that for humans, probably it's not, it doesn't cause, doesn't seem to cause any problems at all in adults. If you vaccinate adults with multiple vaccines at once, maybe children are a special case, but there's, at the moment, there's no evidence to indicate that they are. Okay, so people who believe that vaccines are actually harmful, we kind of have a derogatory name for them, call them anti-vaxxers. I don't mean to belittle what they believe. I mean, it's their, they're, they're worried for legitimate reasons. Um, but the, the anti-vaxxers, people who are against vaccination, generally, I think they've been fed a lot of hysterical misinformation from conspiracy internet websites and things like that, which is generally the case. And they, they've been fed half-truths, in other words. So they, they've been exposed to half-truths, which is one of the problems of the internet. You know, the internet, uh, in the old days, the problem, if you were trying to study a problem, the problem was to get information. It was hard to get information. Today, we have access to all the information you could pro possibly want. The only problem is that not all of it is good information. And so the problem these days is not getting information. The problem is being able to separate good information from bad information and being able to separate truth from half-truth. And so that this is the problem that we're running into now with vaccinations. Okay, so about 20 years ago, there was a famous British physician named Andrew Wakefield who did a study that he suggested, that, that he says suggested that the MMR vaccine was linked to autism. And that if you had the MMR vaccine as a child, you were more likely to develop autism as an adult or as a young adult or as a, as a child. And so suddenly everyone who had an autistic child asked themselves if their child got the vaccine and they said, yes, that must have been what did it. Uh, but Wakefield's work has been disgraced. He admitted that he falsified some of it. He's been, I think he's had his medical license taken away. Uh, and he used a very small sample to do his study. So it, normally if you do uh, a study like this with a small sample, like a thousand children or something, the smaller your sample size is, the less statistically reliable it is, right? So the, if you can conduct a study with lots of people, the results you get will be much more accurate than the results that you get with a small number of people. So Wakefield did this did this uh, case study. He compared two groups, you know, about 500 children who got the MMR vaccine and 500 children who didn't. And then he compared the frequency of autism in the two groups and found that the, the frequency of autism was slightly higher in the group of children who received the MMR vaccine. So then he said, okay, the getting the vaccine, there's a weak correlation between getting the, getting the MMR vaccine and developing aut autistic spectral disorder. And that set off this whole uh, idea that vaccination causes autism. Uh, and then in fact, years later, he admitted that he, he fudged the numbers a little bit. He he, he kind of exaggerated the numbers a little bit, so the difference was even smaller. And then even, even beyond that, if you do a study like this with a small sample size like he did, it's, it's not as reliable if, as if you use a large sample. So let me give you an example of that. If you flip a coin 10 times, you know that statistically that coin should land on its head five times and on its tail five times, right? But you know that in real life, if you flip a coin only 10 times, you probably won't get five heads and five tails because that's a small sample. If you flip the coin a million times, you'll probably get 500,000 heads and 500,000 tails. You might get 501, you know, 500,001 heads and 400,999 tails. There might be a slight difference, but not much. On the other hand, if you flip the coin only 10 times, you wouldn't be at all surprised if you got seven heads and three tails, right? So that's that, that's the advantage of using a large sample size. Okay, so Wakefield used a small sample size. 
Um, if you don't take the MMR vaccine, there are consequences. You can you can end up getting pregnant and getting the measles while you're pregnant, and your baby will have microcephaly. So there there are consequences to not vaccinating your child. There are, as I said, there are websites that are dedicated to this. VaccineTruth.com is one of them that says never you know never inject your children with vaccines. That's it causes problems. There are some famous celebrities. This is an actor named Jim Carrey, who you might have seen as a famous Canadian actor named Jim Carrey, who's a famous anti-vaxxer uh, activist. And they have quite a loud voice and they make quite a lot of fuss about things. But I'm going to tell you about one study that proves that there is, it proves as, as much as it is possible to prove that there is no relationship between vaccination and autism. Okay, so I mentioned the fact that Wakefield study had a very small sample size. All right, now if you if you live in Denmark, the medical system in Denmark is centralized so that all of your medical records go into a central computer and they make the data in that central computer available to epidemiologists. They blank out the names and the addresses and the personal identification numbers, but they give you the they they will give you access to the medical records you can't tell who whose records they are but they can give you access a computerized access to the medical records which makes it very easy to do epidemiology epidemiology studies okay so this group of people in Denmark did a an epidemiology study of children roughly 500,000 children who were who either did or did not get the MMR vaccine in Denmark between 1990 and the year 2000. Okay, so what they found was that between 1990 and 2000, approximately 300,000 children got the vaccine and approximately 200,000 didn't. That's a very large sample size, half a million, right? And then they compared the frequency of autism in those two groups and not only were the was the frequency of autism the same in those two groups on a on a per capita basis but it was actually slightly smaller in the vaccinated group so if anything it proves that vaccination mmr vaccination is not correlated it may even protect you from autism right uh so but generally it was a large sample size and the very small difference between the two groups the small sample size was in favor of the vaccinated group not the unvaccinated group and so this you can't prove a negative right in science you cannot prove a negative you cannot prove that something does not cause something but this is a sample size where they compared half a million they had a sample size of half a million and they found no difference between the frequency of autism in the two groups, whether they were vaccinated or not. They found no difference in the frequency of autism. That's as close as you can possibly come to proving that there's no connection between, uh, between the MMR vaccine and autism. So no correlation between the MMR vaccine and autism. This particular study from the New England Journal of Medicine in 2002, you can look it up for yourself. That's the title of a population-based study of measles, mumps, and rubella vaccination and autism. They took roughly the records of roughly 500,000 Danish children between 1990 and 2000. Roughly 300,000 got the vaccine, 200,000 didn't. And then the proportion of children in each group that had autism as well was the same, meaning there's, there is no correlation between the MMR vaccine and developing autism. Okay, so this has been a, lo a long lecture. I apologize for that. Uh, so classification of viruses, we discussed that. The capsids, different shapes of capsids, and the Baltimore method for discussing genome structure. We talked about the difference between lytic and, and lysogenic, uh, uh, lytic and lysogenic uh, temperate uh, uh, viruses. We talked about oncogenic viruses, difference between oncogenes, proto-oncogenes, and tumor suppressor genes. We learned about how to culture viruses, how to measure viruses using the, the plaque assay and PFU per mil. And then we learned how vaccines work and how the vaccines are the real the only real defense we have against viruses. There are some chemical treatments that help you to get better from a virus once you've already gotten sick from it, but they're not really as effective as, a, as an effective vaccine is when you have a vaccine that works. However, we should be aware of the fact that 
we will not be able to uh, we will not be able to make a vaccine against every possible virus because we don't have a B cell that can make antibodies that can bind that can attach themselves to every uh, possible foreign antigen. Okay, in the next lecture, we'll go through specific examples of viruses and we'll memorize one or two examples of each of the different Baltimore classes of viruses. Uh, in the meantime, you can look in the, uh, on, the, on the Microsoft Teams website and also on the Moodle site, there are some tables that list the different viruses by both viral type and viral tropism. So viral genome type, the DNA viruses versus other types of viruses versus, um, uh, versus the type of tissue they invade. Okay, I'll see you at the next lecture.